I like to think that tactics games, isometric turn-based RPGs, are the meatloaf of video game genres. They're solid, reliable, always at least a bit tasty, but unless you grew up eating your mom's version of it, you probably have no interest or desire or even understanding of why such a dish, such a genre, is so coveted and enduring and loved. It's not pizza, it's not cake, and it's definitely not duck l'orange. Tactics games to those outside the loaf bubble are simply a pile of semi-sweet, semi-gelatinous shaped meat products consumed by a group of people who probably think ketchup is too spicy. Which is to say there is no dynamic movement or controls, usually no flashy graphics, usually little to no cultural impact or social currency or relevancy, and most certainly, by definition, very little intrinsic action. Tactics games are slow, they are deliberate, and they are specific in all aspects, and therein lies the barrier of entry. In order to like meatloaf, you kind of already have to like meatloaf. While this analogy might seem a bit hard to swallow, the effects remain. Tactics games are a niche within a niche and acquire taste, if you will. Despite the proselytizing nature of the genre's fanbase, the apparent influence, the influence measured by sales anyway, is dwarfed by franchises or games like Call of Duty, Candy Crush, FIFA, etc. And even franchises or games within the genre of RPG, or maybe even its own eponymous series. For context, Final Fantasy Tactics has sold just shy of about 3 million copies worldwide across all platforms and versions since its release in June 1997. For comparison, From Software's newest action RPG opus, Elden Ring, has sold over 17 million copies in less than a year of its February 2022 release. And that developer had been considered niche beforehand. High sales does not equate high art for sure, but in this increasingly connected world, high volume is often associated with high influence. This is all to say that while the fervor of such fans of the tactics subgenre is almost always at a pitch not unlike a happy pig at a sloppy trough, the actual day-to-day -day sway is more a gentle lapping than a crashing wave. Despite the realities of you or your friend, not knowing or playing any tactics games, and more specifically Final Fantasy Tactics, hopefully this video will elucidate the reasons why such a game had and has the staying power of any mainline Final Fantasy entry, and RPGs in general, and why it is widely considered one of the best tactics games the genre has on offer. I will try to break down and review gameplay, story, and impact as we come across it. But first, let's start with the story. Some of the best fantasy and sci-fi is often modeled on or around our real life histories. Final Fantasy Tactics is no different in this regard, albeit with magic and monsters, and Yasumi Matsuno, the game's lead writer and director, uses this to great effect. The game's main narrative thrust and general backstory is modeled after the War of the Roses, a real life middle age conflict where a series of civil wars broke out for control of the English monarchy in the 14th century, mostly between two houses the Yorks and Lancasters. In fact, the civil wars existed after a historical period known as the Hundred Years' War, a moniker the game lifts partly, where the socioeconomic issues of the time, collapsing feudalism, proxy wars, high taxes, failing leadership, led to a persistent weakening of the English crown and kingdom. However, the game uses this real-world historical conflict as more an overall springboard to its own story than a one-to-one -one interpretation. The pieces are mostly similar, a grand 50 instead of 100 years war that leaves the crown and kingdom of Ivalice in a precipitous crossroads, and the two main houses or factions at the heart of it, the Order of the Northern and Southern Sky. Their conflict becomes the focal point of this schism and eventually of the civil war dubbed the War of the Lions. Preceding the War of the Lions, Ivalice recovers from a conflict known as the Fifty Years' War, as I previously stated, against a state known as Ordalia. After the king of Ivalice, our main character's adopted father, dies of illness, the vacuum of power immediately following an already bloody and lingering conflict erupts into civil war, mainly because of an issue of succession. Princess Ovelia and Prince Orinus both vie and contend for the throne by rights, but are both too young to claim rule. Thus, a regent would be appointed to rule in their stead until either comes of age. Princess Ovelia is next in line, but she is a woman, and Prince Orinus is but an infant, so the true power of rule would come from the regent apparent, and this is where our Civil War players come in. Prince Goltana of the Black Line supports Ovelia, and Prince Larg of the White Line supports the infant Orinus. And thus the stage and actors are set, we, the player, can begin our journey. 
The game starts, like most games, at the start menu. However, when we choose a new game, instead of seeing a cutscene or general overture, we are introduced instead to a brief of text and to our curator and historian, Arislam Darai, an ancestor of a particular lineage we will meet in the game. Arislam is our de facto narrator and more importantly, our only voice and perspective on the events that will proceed in the game. It's a bold framing device, actually, and a bold way to start the game by admitting to us players that this is not wholly accurate and what is presented in the game can potentially be construed as interpretation or conjecture. Although ultimately I think what we see in the game is the vast truth of it, the unreliable narrator framing device does add to the authenticity and fun of the medieval narrative. In fact, the in-game description of Arislam even suggests his interpretation sparked controversy within whatever modern form of government or academia his time period exists in. From here, we are asked to input a name. We'll use the default and canonical one, Ramza, and a birthday for our character. Now, the birth date seems unimportant, but actually can affect combat heavily via the zodiac sign mechanic. And it works like this. Each zodiac sign out of a possible 12 signs has an opposite, visually understood as numbers would be on a clock. In addition, each zodiac sign has a good-bad compatibility associated with its sister sign. Here's a completely unobtrusive, clear visual guide to what I mean. Got it? In all seriousness though, what this means to us, the player, is that a best compatibility confers a multiplier of 1.5, a good one confers a 1.25 multiplier, a bad one is a 0.75 multiplier, and finally, worst is an abysmal half or 0.5. So, for example, if an attack has a base 50% chance to poison, if a unit has a best zodiac compatibility, that chance would effectively be multiplied by 1.5 times, i.e. a 75% chance to inflict said poison. And that's not counting any buffs or debuffs or gear effects. Luckily, we can completely ignore this mechanic and never think about it again, besides every once in a while wondering why Ancelot does so little damage to that ordinary red chocobo compared to Ramza. But if we decide to min-max or do any sort of challenge run, then this mechanic would best be understood. Oh, and moreover, if our unit is the same sex or opposite sex, this will further influence the compatibility ranking system, but again, this largely can be ignored. And I suppose I'll go over this now, partly because it's germane to the Zodiac system, and partly because you'll probably hear me bitch and bemoan throughout the video about it, but the concept of rational numbers and probability seem to be a sort of four-letter word in Final Fantasy Tactics. Let me explain. The colors red, blue, and green are real. The color of yellow is a mystical experience shared by everybody. These words are said by Guildenstern and Tom Stoppers, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern are dead. And itself is a reference and abstraction of Goat's model of empiricism, which is a philosophy that all knowledge is derived from sense experience. We can never really know something as fact if we cannot first experience or sense it. Final Fantasy Tactics takes that abstraction and applies it to its numerical quotients and systems. Because in fact, and I've done the research, I've done the math, if an attack has an 84% chance to succeed, it's actually 43%. If it's a 23% chance, it's actually 75%. Now stay with me. And of course, if it's a 75% chance, it's closer to 85%. But if it's an actually 12% chance, it's roughly about 25%. If it's 50%, it's actually 42%. If it's 93%, it actually only confers about a 50% chance. 37%? <laughs> nope. 61. 68? Nope. 56. How about 9%? about actually 27%. Anything in the 30% range is an automatic 46% plus. 100% though is indeed true, just as 0% is. So in fact, one can truly never know the correct percentage or probability of success if one does not simply do. It is through the experience the truth becomes known, not the number on the screen, not the knowledge of practice and logic. Only from experience can we all enjoy the mysticism of yellow. Now, for those who have not played this game before, that admittedly muddy analogy and appraisal might seem like complete gibberish, and it very well could be, but for those watching that have played this game before, know that your madness 
is not your own. I see you, I know you, and I know the game is indeed born from some ulterior dark dimension where numbers are actually just cool little squiggles akin to hieroglyphs. I mean, just look at the axes and bags in the game, or Rafa and Merrick. In fact, some of you who have played another excellent series of tactics games called XCOM may be all too familiar with the 99% chance point-blank shotgun somehow missing. This then results in an avalanche, a deluge of death if you will, and misery and bad luck that would make Vegas casinos blush. The initial miss meaning that the enemy gets to respond in kind, having a horse, a string of turns and moves not unlike being hustled at a pool hall, having someone run the table on you, somehow pulling off billion dollar lottery type sequences that completely wipe you out. And this event could and will make one question the ethics of probability, the meaning of choice and consequence, the eventual heat death of the goddamn universe, the futility of control and existence itself. What I mean to say is 1% chance ends up feeling like they forgot to show you the other two missing zeros after the one, you know? I suppose we should actually start the game now, yeah? The story begins in the magic city of Garland, where our two main characters, Ramza and Delita, are about to be deployed to mop up some brigands from the Corpse Brigade, a troop of deferred and ousted knights and soldiers that were cast aside after the Fifty Years' War. After a brief conversation about the political nature of Ivalice, we are ordered to head out and bolster Larg's Northern Order and take down these corpse roads. After a prompt to save for the first time, we are introduced to a small 5x5 five five square field that we can deploy whomever we have on our roster list onto the potential battlefield. This choosing, at first, seems quaint and even perfunctory for the first third of the game, honestly, but this prelude ends up being a subtle and powerful introduction to the concept of Final Fantasy Tactics and tactics games in general. The shape or lineup or initial position of your units will play heavily into your opening actions and thus dictate how the opening enemy volume will go. In some cases, as we come to them, this is a make or break, life or death decision that makes tactics games so alluring and enduring to its fans. The fact that you can lose a battle before it even starts based on seemingly token actions or decisions, in this case unit placement, but most of the time honestly this has little consequence. However, in other cases it may be the only way to survive a clearly overstacked onslaught and win by the skin of your teeth, or the only way to steal a rare item from an enemy that only shows up in that battle, or learn a valuable skill, or to fandangle the enemy AI into attacking your tankiest unit. It is subtle like I said Said, but the sooner one understands this, the smoother some of the more annoying fights will go. So now we can begin the meat and potatoes of our adventure, the thing you'll be doing most in the game, the combat. Since this is ostensibly the tutorial of the game, our units are made up of the most basic of classes, or jobs as they're called in this game. The chemist, who has the ability to throw restorative items at long range and equip guns naturally, and the squire, an all-arounder with a smattering of basic low damage, low stat pumping techniques, and the inherent ability to equip most items in the game. In addition to a job's explicit actions only that job can do, each job or class also has an implicit passive quality. Whether this means the ability to equip certain items and gear, or having naturally higher stats like attack or speed or movement bonuses, to expound, each job is also allowed a sub-job command, which is essentially equipping the active abilities, called commands, of another job. So you could have a unit be a white mage with the sub-job commands of a monk, or a black mage, or knight, and so on and any combination therein. Not only do tactics games rely on combat in an ordered tactical manner, but the ability to outfit your units is equally as comprehensive and purposeful as the moment to moment gameplay. Think of it like a complex domino run, where your goal is not only to start the domino effect that eventually leads to your desired outcome, but being able to actively manipulate the outcome in predetermined instances, your mission and your turns respectively. I will touch on more of these jobs specific soon, and as we come to them. But for now, we are only controlling a couple of chemists and a couple of squires, along with Ramza, our main character, and our guest character, Delita. A guest character being an AI-controlled character that can and will do the stupidest things that make no sense and often do nothing or get themselves killed for no reason. At first, this may seem like a who cares moment because they can't die or turn into crystals or treasure chests, the way a unit is lost permanently in this game and can't be revived in any other way. But there are a few times throughout the playthrough where this quirk of game and AI design will frustrate you to no end, as it did with me, and will result in literally losing the game instantly with zero player input or agency, no matter what you had done beforehand. A proverbial roll of the dice and kick in the nuts 
all at once. I'll point these moments out as we come across them, I mean it'll be hard to miss, for there are few, but when they show up, many a curse words and possibly controllers will be flung at a rapid pace. The tutorial battle is rather simple. The player gets a feel for the combat, the grid-like approach to unit movement and action, the basic controls, the basic understanding of the flow of combat, and interstitial lore and dialogue that pops up in most story missions. It plays out in a rather easy demeanor, nothing too crazy, nothing even a novice couldn't handle. So we beat the brigands of the Corpse Brigade and at the end of the mission, Ramza chastises their lifeless bodies with a sanctimonious, privileged jab about leading a life that would not leave them dead in their beds at old age, but rather in the streets, forgotten. This is important because it shows us that Ramza is a few things, young and headstrong, a bit cloistered and unaware of the greater realities of life outside his proper upbringing, and the fact that he will fight for what he believes in. It may seem a simple jab, a simple interstitial, a medieval one-liner of sorts, but this is actually a thesis for Ramza and it is what we should expect going forward from him. Most players in their first playthrough of this game will see the red dot on the map and the cream colored line connecting to it from their current position and think to themselves, well, I guess I will walk that line to the dot and then we'll walk that line to the dot. And then when the next line comes, the next dot appears, those same logical based players will repeat the action until, eventually, the final credits roll and the game is completed. This is cause and effect writ naturally, but for experienced seasoned loaf players of Final Fantasy Tactics, Mandalia Plains, the first line and dot of the game respectively, the first map and tile set you are allowed to move between, may as well be the last node before the final boss, before the credits roll, because from these humble Taurish plains where feral cats and goblins and striding chocobos come to do battle, we will meet them and destroy them over and over over and over again until our roster is filled with dual wielding knights, samurai dancers, ninja bards, time mage mathematicians, or even dark knights who dabble in the holy art of white magic. And thanks to certain emulators, we players can blaze through these grinding sessions by quartering the time necessary for such an endeavor. We can't effectively become gods for the first 60% of the game simply by beating up our own party members, like some violent, sadistic version of patty cake. And this is what I have opted to do for this playthrough. I decided to play how an experienced degenerate in Final Fantasy Tactics should play, but hilariously overpowered so the story missions can be completed with little regard for difficulty, at least until the final WeGraph fight, but we'll get to that eventually. The Final Fantasy Tactics leveling system mostly deals with combat. In other words, when one performs an action during combat, one is awarded a certain amount of experience and JP, or job points. The points necessary to acquire various active, reactive, passive, and movement-based abilities for any one job. Once a unit receives 100 experience, that unit levels up, gaining stats and HP slash MP. In addition to said experience, a unit also receives a ratio amount of JP based on the current level of that unit's job. However, if a unit attacks a lower level unit, that experience will be reduced accordingly. But here's the rub, JP will not be reduced, and so any action confers a reliable repeatable amount of JP regardless of unit experience level. This all means that in one battle, given enough patience and time, and sometimes potions, a player could theoretically master a job, which is the act of acquiring all abilities the job has on offer, as well as getting to the max job level of 8. The way a player changes and acquires new jobs or new classes is by combining certain levels of other jobs. For example, the dancer job requires the unit to be female and to have the geomancer leveled up to 4 and the lancer job leveled to 4 as well. So what I will do for this playthrough is try to get Ramza to dual wield swords as a knight and master the knight job, and this requires being a ninja, which in itself requires leveling a few other jobs to certain thresholds. The reason why having an emulator arbitrarily speed up the game is so that what would normally take a boring 15 to 20 hours of throwing stones and potions and yelling at my units will be cut down significantly. As you will, at certain points in the game story, acquire special units and characters, this initial burst of versus utility in the roster will try to diminish the absurd power creep some of these story units will provide. Thunder God, I'm looking at you. Even being overleveled, eventually the power curve will flatten out and I'll actually have to play the game in a somewhat competent way. Uh, that being said, there are still certain fights in the game that are pretty brutal. So much so that my first 
ever played through a Final Fantasy Tactics way back in the late 90s forced me to restart the game over entirely because I essentially bricked my save and was stonewalled and could not progress because I was simply not prepared for a certain fight the game forces upon you. And many times they do this back to back. Basically, my first 10-ish hours of this playthrough will be a montage of Mondalia Plains. So enjoy. The story point of Mundalia Plains is also where we meet a certain prick of a character known as Argith, or Argus for the OG Tactics players. Argith is a low-level nobleman from a mid-tier noble house and is currently being accosted by some enemy squires and thieves. Here we are introduced to our first taste of how, let's say, unfortunate the guest AI can be for us. We are given a choice to either A, help Argith, or B, destroy the enemy. A cool little bit of stat fun happens in this choice as well. Anytime you are presented with such a choice for a story battle, no matter what option you choose, Ramza's bravery or faith substat is increased or decreased. Decreased. Bravery affects physical damage. The greater the number to a cap of 100 or 0, the more damage you deal and receive. And faith affects magical damage. The more you have, the more magical damage you deal and receive. A funny note, the cutoff for low bravery units is 9. So if a unit has 9 or lower bravery, they will literally turn into a chicken and become uncontrollable and will flee all around the battlefield. But there's benefit too. The move find movement ability that chemists have allow the player to find items on certain tiles of a battlefield, sometimes extremely rare and powerful items, especially in the dark dungeon endgame activity, and the lower the bravery a unit has, the greater chance the item found will be of a rare variety. However, be warned, at 15 bravery or lower, the unit has a chance to desert your roster at the end of the battle. This can include story recruited units as well. In any case, after dispatching the rogues harassing Argoth, he pleads for us to take him back to the high seat of Beowulf and to the Order of the Northern Sky, Egros Castle. Argoth reveals that his Marquis, Marquis Elmdor, has been captured by the Corpse Brigade. But for the next 7-10 to 10 hours, we will be hard grinding to get JP, so Argoth and the Marquis Elmdor de Limberry will have to wait. I will try to get Ramza dual wielding, I will try to get a unit basically to steal anything I need for later missions via the Thief, and I will give at least a few other units the ability to Chakra and Revive to very very useful JP grinding and leveling abilities from the monk job. Before we venture off to Egros, we'll probably end up roughly in the low 20s or mid 20s for our unit's levels. That'll give a good smattering of job abilities, and while I could keep going until I literally max out every job on Mandalia Plains, I prefer my sanity, and for the brevity of this video, I will decide to stop around there. So, after our grinding session on the holy lands of Mondalia Plains, we finally venture back into the story into our second map, the Siege Wheel, where we will quickly dispatch some goblins and bomb monsters. Delita and Argoth exchange tensions and Ramza gets annoyed, as usual, but my dancers and bards have a fun time debuffing the enemies to a point where I essentially remove half their units and my bard makes sure we are topped off with re-raise and haste and regen, as one does. On a side note, the bard and dancer jobs are quite nice for JP grinding because their fastest abilities do low damage and have low recovery, and have such low CT, the time it takes between turns, that it allows them to act more frequently and still complete their actions. Meaning, if a unit is at max HP and you heal that unit, you will receive no experience or JP from that action. So, it behooves you to squeeze out even a 1 HP heal or damage in order to get the full amount of JP from that action. You may see me do this in the video where I will toy with the enemy units as long as I can in order to keep the JP train a going. Choo choo. This is how you grind like a true degenerate. Next up is Trade City Dorter and its slums. This is the story mission where we are introduced to Weegraf, a soon to be thorn in our side for the first half of the game. Weegraf is grilling one of his corpse brigade subordinates about the plot and the abduction of Marquis Elmdor. It seems our brigand leader has a bit of a leaky company and some men seem to be loyal to someone else. After scaring the subordinate to give up where the Marquis is located, Sand Rat Siege in the Southern Desert, Ramza and Lads bust in and scare off Weegraf. This fight is actually the first time where the game tests you. It can be a fairly tough fight if you just went straight from map to map without grinding at all. The archer at the top of the favela can easily pick your weaker units off and the two black mages can outright one-shot you. In addition to the tanky knight and the terrible guest AI, the other two archers round out the enemy rank 
ranks to make the fight a bit of a dangerous one. I suggest taking care of the archer on the favela first, and then going from there. However, considering I'm level 27 and the enemy's level 2, I make very quick work of these dullards and continue on with the story. The captured brigand reveals he is from a splinter faction within the corpse brigade. At the threat of a beating or torture by our well-adjusted bourgeoisie friend Argath, Ramza rebukes this threat and instead pleads logic with the captured enemy, even though Argath remains the interrogator. And quite the happy one at that. Remember, the Corpse Brigade are simply soldiers who were cast aside in the previous 50 years war. They were loyal, they were competent, and they heeded the call of their lords and rallied their bannermen when it was required. By rights, the Corpse Brigade have done all that a dutiful soldier or knight or countryman should, and all they want is to be paid their due and to be recognized as honorable men. They didn't choose this life in their minds. It was the crown that forced their now criminal hand. And someone like Argith, a proxy for the crown and nobility and power of Ivalice, cannot understand this because one station in life is for life regardless of outcome or prejudice. The haves will have, and the have-nots will remain empty. This is the way of things for Argath and by proxy the crown. I mean, he calls these loyal soldiers swine, for God's sakes, muck-ridden animals made for the slaughter. To say we should think highly of Argath, of the nobility of Ivalis, is to admit that we are no better than those that cast these men aside. This scene is the wedge that ultimately bifurcates Ramza and Talita, even if they cannot see it yet. Does one correct this behavior, this mindset, save the sinking country, or does one let it all die and birth something new, something built from the ashes of mistake? Ramza is an idealist, but so is Delita. They just simply come at the same goal through different prisms. This will be elucidated more as the story progresses, but no, this is why the writing in this game, particularly in the PSP remake, is so beloved. It's not your average JRPG or fantasy story or tropes. There are true characters and stakes at play. After outfitting our units at the shop, which periodically updates with new weapons and armor as the story progresses, we adjust some job actions and allocate some job points, and we continue on to Z-Claw's Desert, the home of the splinter faction of the Corpse Brigade. Hold up in a dilapidated building, Ramza and Troop corner the enemy in their siege and do battle. Again, if I weren't so overpowered, this fight sometimes can be a tough one because the game forces you to split your party in two, and the archer again, with the crossbow inside the siege, will be protected by his knights and high damaging monks, and will sometimes pick off your units as you close in and surround them. I suppose a cornered animal is truly the most dangerous after all. But not even a cornered, rabid animal could assuage my overpowered units from their song of fury and death. I obliterate these fools with rapidity. After the battle, we view a scene where Wegraf confronts Gustav, the splinter faction leader, and chastises him for the error in judgment by the point of a sword. Gustav appeals and says dreams do not fill a man's stomach, but this does little to sway Wegraf. He is steadfast in his resolve to correct the crown in its discriminant path. Perhaps Gustav was correct, perhaps he was a tragic figure, but we will never know because Wegraf has had enough and silences Gustav forever. I love this scene because the thrust and slash and death rattle are so well animated and so full of character, even though it's just a collection of pixels, that it really highlights again why this game is so highly regarded, certainly to me. The music, the especially unctuous sound design, the beautiful animations, the wonderful writing, the addicting gameplay, the overall package screams passion and creativity, and it oozes out every orifice this game possesses. Complexity is good, but simplicity is often better, even though it paradoxically is often a lot harder to achieve. When something is simple and yet evokes such strong emotion or connection, that is the definition of success in my opinion. Much like how a short story must convince the reader of its importance or beauty through economy of language, 20,000 words to make a point is fine, but 20 words to make the same point, now that's difficult. In any case, Wegraf allows us to access the ailing Marquis and take him back to Egros in exchange for his freedom. Further saying this was not his company's intention. What they want is real change, not to be branded as simple sellswords or criminals, or brigands. Back in Egros, Lord Dystarg, half-brother of Ramza, wants answers. Delita attempts to shift blame on himself, but of course the Ned Starkian Ramza cannot allow that. Dystarg doesn't care though, and as an older Lord brother would, castigates Ramza for his insubordination. Duke Larg, the would-be King Regent of the Northern Sky, suddenly appears from the unseen corners of the hall, and in his infinite patience, permits our troop to aid in the final campaign against the Corpse Brigade. Dystarg and Larg, however, seem to have a plans of their own. 
and make mention to each other of the Marquis and of Gustav and of the ailing king of Ivalice. Quite the trifecta, don't you think? I mean, if this isn't the face of a man who only wants good from the realm, then I don't know what is. Our next map and battle is at Brigand's Den, south of Mandalia Plains. Once a home for fishermen, it is now overrun with brigands and we are tasked to rout these squatters out. A young female knight, Maluda, sister of Weegraf, and her cohorts discuss the strife within their company, detailing their losses and anxieties. It seems the walls are closing in and they know it. After defeating all of Maluda's convoy, she relents and flees, but not without some parting words. She designates us as no different than her, just because we were all born between different sets of walls. She should be held as flawed and not Ramza, not the aristocracy. She and her family starved and fought and scraped by and to call her thieves as we steal from their right to live is tantamount to war. And of course, Argoth denies these claims and further instills his caste worldview by calling her father baseborn and her mother a gutter whore and her chattel. Charming fella, that one. Argoth claims it is his divine right, his highborn status, and Maluda rejects that notion, saying all men are equal under the eyes of the gods. After the two's exchange, Delita has a simple but powerful epiphany and question aimed at Ramza, and by proxy at the crown. Is this woman truly our enemy? Who exactly is in the wrong here? We transgress against people who just want what they're owed, and we have party members like Argith, out of touch rich boy who sees himself a soldier of divinity, who wants to eradicate people like Maluda. Again, who exactly are the good guys here? In the meantime, at Egros Castle, high seat of Galleon, at the manse of Beolf, Tietra, or Tetra, Delita's younger sister, is taken hostage. In an attempt to abscond with Alma, Ramza's younger sister, Ramza's older half-brother Zalbag dispatches the abductor with ease. He is a feared warrior for a reason, after all. Dystark is wounded severely, however, in the apparent assault at Beolf Manor, and he orders Lord Zalbag to scour every nook and cranny for the brigands and eviscerate them all. The dominoes have begun to fall. Dystarg informs Ramza and company that Zalbag will lead a final assault on the brigands' garrison once it is found, and he promises he has taken measures to ensure Tietra's safety. She is like a sister to him, he says. Insert shifty Dystarg face. Delita fumes outside the Bay of Mance, and Ramza desperately tries to curtail his anger. Ramza wants to do the orderly, nightly, right thing, but Delita knows the truth of it. If not for him to rescue his one and only sister, who else will? They are not highborn, they are not nobility. He must take action himself, he cannot rely on those who promise power. He must wield his own power. It's an important turning point for Delita's character, and another reason as to why he is probably my favorite character in the story. Delita truly recognizes the fault of inaction, of duty, of claim, of station, and understands that in order for the world to care, he must make the world care. His character throughout the entire story is constantly riding this moral line. Delita is a truly great complex character because he is willing to scheme and act and do what must be done in order for the world to reflect how he wants it. It would be very easy for him to slip into villainhood, but as the story progresses you'll see why his actions tend to be the right one, even if you, the player, might not initially agree with them. In the end, you will ask yourself if Delita is a good man, and you will probably not have an easy answer. In my opinion, that's what makes a good character, regardless of how you feel about them, you can understand why they did what they did and recognize the intent and outcome as sometimes being difficult to discern. Argith comes outside to meet the two arguing friends to essentially add fuel to the fire and suggests that Tietra isn't worth the trouble and the fact that Dystarg has given any regard to her is pure grace and should be seen as a gift to someone of such low nobility as Delita and Tietra are. Delita takes this well and thanks Argith's sage advice by decking the fool in his smarmy face and then runs off in a huff. Argith appeals to Ramza, but Ramza is done with his shit just as much as Delita is and tells Argith to leave and never return. Argith tells us to head to Fort Zeekton, the probable location of the Corpse Brigade headquarters, Argith wishes his soft-hearted friend luck in the coming battles, but only shrugs when his words are not taken and he is told once again to be gone. For all of Argith's bluster and sanctimonious blathering, he often has a sharper wit to the politics that surround the kingdom of Ivalice. He's a dick through and through, a pious cunt for sure, but his advice is wise nonetheless. Even though he's a villain or antagonist, there is still wisdom in his words and what pisses off Delita so much about Argith, I suspect, is that he somewhat agrees with Argith's assessment. The world is stratified, 
Argus makes sure we are reminded of this. So does Dice Dargan Larg, and it is a bitter pill to swallow for Delita. Hence his frustration and anger, even though Argus remains rather plain about it all. Argus is being judgmental, but he is also speaking plainly and pragmatically. What I love about these exchanges is that Delita becomes a sort of fusion of Argus and Ramza, the idealistic and good nature of Ramza, and the pragmatic and cold nature of Argus. But that character turn has yet to happen. As we leave Egros Castle, we are treated to the first of many CG cutscenes that PSP Remake has introduced. It's beautiful, isn't it? Do you think... Do you think Titra might be watching this same sunset? Don't worry, Delita. I'm sure she is well. Something's been bothering me, Ramza, for some time now. Argat's words trouble you, am I not right? There are things beyond the power of our changing, Ramza. Try though we might. Do not say that. If a thing can be endeavored, it will endeavor. Grant me an army. I would save Titra with these hands, if aught were in my power to do. But I cannot. Tis my meager lot in this life. of a blade of grass. Originally, this scene was played out in an in-game cutscene, just like any other cutscene, so to see this redone in a grander way is quite nice. I appreciate the effort, even if I have trouble never enjoying the 3D anime style. At Linalian Plateau, we meet again, and for the last time, we graph sister Maluda. She leads a party looking for egress, but laments that truly there is nowhere left to run. This is it. And she's right, our party quickly defeats these brigands and kills Maluda. Our next map is Fovaham Windflats, at a small windmill and farm where Wegraf waits for his sister's report that will never come. Wegraf grills one of his subordinates and asks why they decided to kidnap Tietra. Gragoroth admits it was the only way to help them escape, not to mention she may be a useful bargaining chip, for they incorrectly think she is of Baal's blood. Wegraf does not enjoy the kidnapping, the ransoming, for he wants to be taken seriously. He wants a better world for his men and their children. He is an idealist, caught between reality and obscurity, and he feels his ideals slipping through his fingers every waking moment. Wegraf would rather die than betray his ideals, and so would allow others in his employ to die as well. His behavior is frankly just like Delita's, just like Dystar, just like Kultana, just like all those who vie for power and change, but he just can't quite do what needs to be done yet. One of his ranks informs him of Maluda's death, and he comes to meet those that ended her in battle. This battle is the first time we see the terrible power and threat of Wegraf. While I am still too overpowered for him to do anything of import, this marks the first time we are on the receiving end of a Holy Knight or White Knight in the PSP version, and of the job command Holy Sword Arts. In addition to his fearsome abilities, Wegraf is also equipped with better items than we can even buy at the moment, so his attacks will be even stronger. We will receive a few party members whom will have this job as their default, so we will eventually be able to use these ridiculously overpowered abilities ourselves but for now, we must only witness it and enjoy the fun animations. Holy Blade Art allows sword wielders to attack at a distance in addition to targeting multiple tiles and therefore multiple units. The cherry on top is that each ability also confers a detrimental status effect like stop or death or silence, which even if the move only does one damage, the status effect itself can completely turn the tide of battle and basically make one lose or win instantly. Even though Wegraf states he will die trying to avenge Maluda, the second we damage him enough, he teleports away. This will happen a lot in our playthrough, so get used to it. Well, actually, in this case, even though I am 
so much stronger than him, one of Wiegraf's holy sword techniques can cause instant KO or instant death, and this will trigger him teleporting away, um, as well as he uses it to one-shot Ramza. He also gains a level by doing this to add salt to the wound, so there's that. This is where the true motives of the Order are laid bare. Gustav kidnapped the Marquis under the orders of Duke Larg and Dystard and Zalbag in order to capture power in the wake of the King's death. The Civil War has come to the forefront. Forward now to the snowy fort of Ziegden, the last bastion of the nearly routed Corpse Brigade. Gragoroth, the most metal name a soldier could possibly have, holds Tietra on a rampart and tells Argith and Zalbag to stay put or he'll kill her. He sweetens the threat to include the stores of gunpowder, packed within the keep as a literal self-destruct mechanic and last-ditch effort if things go sour. Zalbag doesn't parlay with terrorists, however, and so orders Argoth to let loose an arrow into the only impediment to victory. And just as the arrow is flung from Argoth's crossbow, Delita and Ramza witness it all. Gragoroth, being a true soldier, had no intentions of ever killing Tetra, and as the killing blow strikes her gut, he cannot help but exclaim to the gods before he too is almost killed and absconds into the fort. Delita calls Argith a horse and dog, and Argith agrees to the fight. Ramza is in disbelief that his brothers would stoop to such craven tactics so unbecoming of Lord Lieges such as they are. During the battle, Ramza asks why Argith followed such an order, and Argith rebukes such a moral assertion by stating that they, the highborn, are fundamentally different to those who are lowborn. It is simply the way of life, of fate. Had they been mongering flowers on some street corner as their lot should, they would yet live. He asks why Ramza would take up arms against his own family, his own house and order. Ramza says they would never justify a tactic and Argith is simply in awe at how someone so naive was lucky enough to be born of such high status. He is disgusted at the bleeding of this sheep. Ramza should be a true Baelv and rule those that need ruling, the true duty of his lineage. Ramza doesn't like the idea of being a puppet, however, of someone who has no free will, but Argith disagrees, suggesting that the true puppets stand before them, ready to beckon their puppeteer's commands. House Beolv is the aegis of lesser houses. To survive is to command, to survive is to serve. The real truth of a feudal society. Argith points out that even Ramza uses those around him, much like his best friend Delita. If you had chosen to kill the attackers at Mandalia Plains and not help Argith, Argith now will tell you that it was the correct choice, morally and tactically, that Ramza thought as a highborn would, as a ruler would, as his house should. Stunned, Ramza falls silent. Argith decides to antagonize Delita by showing him that such commoners as he and his sister are should be relegated to dismissal and obscurity. By rights, this stage is not theirs to strut upon, and Argith will show him this reality and kill him as he did his sister. Delita finally decides right there, right then, that he will not be told what to do or when. Not by Argith, not by anyone else. This is the point Delita procures resolve and sets forth in his own path. And in his fury, Delita denies Ramza's concern for his life and tells him in no uncertain terms that once Argith is dealt with, Delita will come after Ramza. Ramza is also defeated by this notion. In one fell swoop, Ramza's crystalline worldview is shattered. His house is built upon lies and corpses, his best friend has abandoned him, and he has no idea who he is at the moment and who he needs to be in order to right all the wrongs he's being bombarded with. Delita is reborn from the ashes of defeat while Ramza is cast down to the lowest depths he's ever been at. When Argith dies, so does the old world, and from this fight the real story begins. Something is rotten in the state of Ivalice, and in the next chapter of the game the stench of it comes to a fracture point and the real threat is revealed. The War of the Lions will show us who and what the true Zodiac Braves are. I'm sorry, Delita. What was that? The powder. Delita, we must away.
I had lived my life the only way that I had known. But when the pillars of that life came crashing down, I did not stand and watch them fall. I turned and walked away. Princess! This way! Be quick! And try making a little less noise! I'll not take orders from you! You've quite a mouth on you, Princess! Forgive me. Tis your birth and faith that wrong you, not I. fight under the banner of Duke Cortana. Technically speaking, the start of the game is not at Garlin, but at Orbone Monastery. And that golden knight we see in the intro FMV, the one you just saw, is in fact Delita. He is on a mission to abduct the would-be princess, Lady Ovelia. Her holy knight Agri stays by her side and informs her that her hired convoy has arrived. In walks an older man clad in umber armor, Gafgarian, and would you know it, Ramza is there with him as well. It seems he is now a mercenary of sorts. In the time since Zeekdin, Ramza has turned away from his duty of lineage in order to find his own path in life. Agrius admonishes Gafgarian, but his curt retort implies he holds little regard for such formality or holy disposition. He is a coin for hire, and he will only pay heed to those that pay. He is in the employ of the northern sky, not of it, he says, so these courtesies mean little. Agrius, however, is a true white knight, a true aegis of the church, and comports herself accordingly. She might be stiff in the ways of social elegance, but she is earnest and dutiful, and, we'll see, quite the formidable warrior. 
However, a knight under Aegiris informs us the enemy to lead his party, Duke Altana's party, they think, is upon us. To battle we must, and earn our keep, says Gafgarian. This is technically the first time we, the player, are allowed to issue commands and move our units, get a feel for the game, etc. But the battle is nigh impossible to lose, so it's more an interactive cutscene than anything else. As we will see, Aegris, a holy or white knight, dispatch the various archers with Stasis Blade or Stop Blade for the OG fans. And of course, Gafgarian is a Feld Knight and will use the Knight Blade, a powerful HP absorb that will sometimes one-shot the enemy. Lucky for us players, the Dark Knight job has this ability as well, and others, so we'll get to use this eventually ourselves. But for now, the two guests in our party make quick work of the enemy till the battle is won, and we get another quick FMV for our efforts. So fast forward past chapter one of the game after the battle and after Delita absconds with Princess Avelia, the heir apparent that the Northern Sky backs, if you remember, Gafgarian asks Ramza if he knows that Golden Knight. An old Gaffy boy may seem the ruffian or the cantankerous old man mercenary, but he's perceptive and knows which way the wind blows, even if Ramza won't admit it. Agri says she will pursue Delita, even if the sellsword Gafgarian says he will not. Elder Simon, the head priest of Orbone Monastery, warns Agris of the danger, but she will not relent. The oath of a knight is to protect, and that is the end of it. Ramza insists, however, that he be allowed to venture with her. It's been some time since he's seen Delita, since Zeekton, and he seems to stand in opposition of their once sworn house, so Ramza must understand the motives of his estranged friend. Kafkarian doesn't even argue and capitulates readily. Interesting, I'd say. We can elect to attain Lad, the Squire, or the two knights with Agris into our roster. I choose to do so because I'll mostly use them for tavern missions. Little events you can assign units to when venturing into a city's tavern where you can get a nice quick chunk of JP. There are some strategies when using tavern missions, like using particular jobs for particular missions, but in most cases this simply confers a slight increase in JP gained and won't wholly prevent you from any content. Also, because I'm using an emulator with speed modifiers and save states, this makes the tavern missions all but a cakewalk, where usually you have to send up to three units away for a predetermined amount of days, each day counting as traveling from one node on the map to another. Oftentimes you'll have to pass through a green node, a place where a random battle can occur, which can trigger a fight that you might not have enough units for. Though luckily story acquired special sprite units will remain deployable. So having save states where I can click a button and magically not have to fight that random battle makes the tavern missions that much more digestible and quick to complete. I will have Ramza as a black mage the majority of this chapter for reasons twofold. One, to make fights a little harder because why not, I'm way over leveled anyway, but mainly to get him on the path to Dark Knight, which requires mastering black mage, knight, and having 50 personal kills with that unit. The Black Mage has a lot of abilities, so it is one of the most time-consuming of the JP grinds, hence it's best to start that grind now as we blaze through the story missions. Our next map is back at Dorder, actually. Here, a Thief for Hire discusses payment for our party's heads, with an unnamed Purple Knight. 500 gil per head, negotiated up to 700, not bad, not bad. However, for the Cell Sword in question, not even a billion gil could be enough because not only am I overleveled, I am the main character. Plot armor is the densest material known to man, after all, impenetrable and ineffable. The poor bastard doesn't know what's going to hit him. This is one of my favorite maps in the game because it puts your party at a severe disadvantage in the outset, as the archers will rain hell down on you, and because I just love the diorama-esque blue tiled buildings and there's just so much character present in such a compact space. It's one of the maps that really show off the arts direction and level design and how the team at Squaresoft squeezed every possible ounce of juice from that creative fruit. And considering the PlayStation only had two megabytes, that's two megabytes of RAM to use, that's quite the tiny fruit to squeeze. Also, I just love how we get to see what a thief's hairline looks like under that green nasty do-rag. In any case, after routing the enemy team, Agrius suggests that we head to Fort Besselat, the most logical stronghold Avilia would be held at. After upgrading our equipment at the castle slash town slash ports, each having different wares available, we head to Aragui Woods, the great forest bisecting our path to Fort Besselat. We get another choice to make in this fight by either helping or ignoring a helpless chocobo. I elect to ignore him because in the end it doesn't matter, and regardless of choice I will be offered to add the chocobo to my party at the end of the fight. And yes, you can recruit monsters into your party and breed them, and in fact basically become a beast master if you choose, but moreover the guest AI will most likely kill the chocobo by running into the middle of a pack of goblins and getting fisted to death. If I choose to help the chocobo, the goal shifts from routing the enemy to protecting the chicken horse. 
which means if the chocobo dies, the game is over. So yeah, I am most definitely never choosing the escort option if I can. Oh, and just to clear up the party roster, I deny the scared chicken horse clemency and leave it in the woods to you know, presumably die because my God, those goddamn chicken horses will breed like crazy and lay like 12 eggs in the span of three maps. And it gets annoying real fast, especially since I'm not doing a monster challenge run or chocobo only challenge run or what have you. So sorry, PETA, no monsters for me in this playthrough. Next up is Zirschel Falls, a cool waterfall map that I love because it allows my Geomancers to have some fun. Also, it is where we finally catch up with Delita and the princess. A few knights surround the two and beg for her release, but Delita knows that their true orders are most likely that of a fatal variety, and he does not buy into their lies. And speaking of lies, one of the knights orders our beloved Gafgarian to murder us all, so that's nice. Gafgarian is mildly amused, but a contract is a contract, and so obeys the order. Agaris thinks him a turncoat, but he reminds her that he was in the employ of the northern sky all along and the knights over there are of the northern sky it's just that simple the abduction was a ruse a way to get ovelia out in the open and kill her without political blowback in the attempt to secure the throne by rights aka larg and dystar ordered it they made it look like Ultana did the deed and thus have an open route to war and the throne. Delita understood this, but he still thinks there's something even deeper amiss. He even addresses Ramza as if to say, See, told you this is how they operate, now you know. Ramza, in his unflappable goodness, denies allowing another Tietra to happen, and so denies Gafgarian's command and employ, and once again freeing himself from someone else's wake, and we find ourselves opposed to Gafgarian in battle. Now, I didn't do it this time because I'm so over level that I just don't care, but normally I would have de-equipped all of old Gaffy Boy's gear and left him stark in the wind so as to easily make him a dead fish and not able to use his Nightblade ability. This is important lesson for any time we receive a guest character in our roster, we will most likely almost immediately strip them of their items, like a good coven or cult would, and give them the hand-me-downs of broadswords and linen robes or whatever, because sometimes they have very rare items and they will just leave our roster in a few battles anyway, so might as well get the most out of them. During the fight, Delita and Ramza share words for the first time in six months, and both exclaim they are doing the right thing, trying to save Princess Ovelia, just seemingly from total opposite vectors. Perhaps he sees the verve and wit and youth of his sister Tietra in Ovelia, which will become somewhat problematic much later in the story, and so idealizes her and wants to free her from being used as a tool for others' gain, much like he and Tietra were. But what's interesting, and what we kind of suspect and see in small glimpses throughout the story so far, is that Delita is basically using Ovelia as well. Even if for his own self-governing, self-idealized goals, he still uses her as all the other players in this Game of Thrones do. The vibe of the benevolent dictator, if you will. Or in other words, a king. Again, while Gafgarian is a villain to us, he's also a bit of a cheeky one at that, and I love how he immediately calls out Delita's self-aggrandizing as posturing, calling him a sellsword as well, that he was ordered to take the princess all the same. That white mustache of his is there for a reason. He's been around, he knows the score. Someone let slip the plot to kidnap the princess, and that someone is indeed controlling something even grander behind the scenes. Agaris scolds Gafgarian and his road to perdition, saying that just because the princess is adopted, she is still of royal lineage and must be treated as such. But Gafgarian points out the truth of things, much like the other villains in the story, her net worth is spent. She is an obstacle in the way to power that must be overcome. This is how the crown works, how the aristocracy hunts. Agrius, the ever dutiful holy knight, cannot abide this worldview and cannot fathom such inequity. That woman will have a hard fall, let me tell you. Ramza argues with Gafgarian too, but old Gaffy boy puts the soft-hearted Ramza in his place and tells him a job is a job. Whether it was him or not, this was going to happen, no matter what. Might as well be him who collects the coin. There is no good, there is no right here, only ambition. After letting Gafgarian flee, we clean up the rest of the knights and finish the battle. A funny little tidbit here is that no matter where Ovelia is on the map, in my case at the top of the waterfall, when the battle ends, every unit that is alive turns to look at her. It's a bit cute if not a little nightmarish. Let the princess with me. She will be safer in my care. What is this game you play with us, Delita? Game? I do no more than speak the truth. You've made an enemy of the entire Order of the Northern Sky. Where would you now take her? Think, Ramza. This was Duke Larg's plan, and he would not act without counsel of the Queen. You cannot trust the Crown. Would you then turn to Goltana? No, that would be folly. 
He would only offer up your heads in hopes of keeping his own. And what, sir, would you propose to do? I would do only that which you, my lady, cannot. You speak in nothings. So I do. But pay it no mind. I shall leave her with you for yet a while longer. Delita! I did not think we would meet again, but I'm glad we have. It was Titra. She watched over me then, as she does now. is not our last. I owe you my thanks as well. But he's right. The northern sky will not be long in falling on us now. This is the path I've chosen. Ramza realizes he again has nowhere to go and no one to turn to. Agrius suggests they all go to Cardinal Delacroix and to the Church of Glapidos in Lionel Province for aid, for surely they can help, surely. We continue the story with our next map, the castled city of Zeland, an elevated city built atop a small mountain which serves as a gateway to Lionel. The map certainly reflects this description as our units must first traverse a winding vertical path in order to breach the fort walls and further ourselves into Lionel Province. Some units with a high jump stat would be highly recommended here. We are also introduced to Mustadio, a machinist from the workshop city of Gouge. His job is unique and is replicated by none other in the game. Well, actually Balthier, and yes, that Balthier has these abilities too, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Although bare on-job actions, the three the job has are extremely powerful and very efficient ways to completely disable enemy units. His snipe ability allows him to do normal attack damage with the added status effect of disable, which, as you might expect, disables enemy actions, and immobilize, which, again, unsurprisingly, disables a unit's movement and the often overlooked but insanely useful Seal Evil, which has a guaranteed chance to turn any undead or ghost enemy unit into stone. Petrifying. There are a few story battles and random battles where Seal Evil is exceptionally useful, so don't sleep on it. Also, the Oracle Job and Beowulf, a side quest character with his own special job, Templar Knight, can also cast Petrify, so you don't have to use Mustadio for the undead monsters and units, but Mustadio's ability pairs very well with the insane range of a gun that his job can equip naturally and requires no MP to use. Basically, it's free real estate. Also, his sprite has a sweet ponytail if you're into that sort of thing. Some hired goons from a rival trading company have cornered Mustadio and demand from him a certain precious stone he is apparently in possession of. A thing called Aurasite. If you've played Final Fantasy XII before, or a certain raid in Final Fantasy XIV, some of these names and words should seem familiar. In any case, the goons make mention of Mustadio's father being held hostage, but Mustadio has a message for their master and employer, Ludovic. They lay a finger on his father, he destroys the stone. A little dead man switch here. For whatever dumb reason, I decide to help Mustadio instead of just killing the enemy units. So therefore, I must protect him and pray his AI doesn't get him killed. All goes well, fortunately, and after the battle, Mustadio confirms those that chased him were of Barrett Company, but also reveal that they're a bit more sinister than the public knows. Opium smuggling. Yes, apparently opium exists in Ivalis. Slave trading and all sorts of things of ill repute. He further explains he's of Gouge, a rival city-state, a place where ancient machines from lost civilizations lay buried beneath the city, where they discovered the lost technology of guns, relics from the lost age of Saint Ajora, a woman from Eon's past who saved the realm with her Zodiac Braves at her side. Mustadio mentions Cardinal Delacroix as a hero of the Fifty Years' War and agrees to Agrius's plan to find respite within the Church of Glabidos at Lionel. Mustadio Mustadio wants an audience with the Cardinal as much as Agrius and the Princess do, for he wants him to rescue his father. Hands washing hands, as it were, and so everyone, even the Princess Avelia, consent to the plan, and we venture off to our next story node, Elias Tor. But actually not before we get a quick cutscene. 
Agrius attempts to assuage Ovelia's concerns, but Ovelia remains anxious about the constant running and hiding. She laments her cloistered upbringing. Her entire life was spent behind the safety of the castle, after all, essentially a prisoner to her own office. She was once a pauper, an orphan under the care of a local monastery before she was adopted by Ramses' father, the late king. And still, Ovelia remained in the background, far removed from the realities of the kingdom, only knowing that men die for her because she is called a princess. Ovelia reaffirms the game's strong motif of agency and duty. For much like Delita or Ramza or the Cell swords we cut down, she is not above what she is defined to be. Title must dictate action, and so she is swept up in this grand current of fate, unable to swim against it. Ovelia mentions another girl who thought the same as her, whom had the same lot in life actually, Ram's sister Alma. Ovelia is rightfully worried the Cardinal will use her, like literally every other person in her life has done, a fair and logical assessment. Ramza teaches Ovelia the same method of grass whistling his father taught him and Delita in a show of solidarity and brotherhood. Uh, technically, they are family after all, and it's a nice bit of sweetness before the inevitable bitterness to come. On the next map of Belize Tor, we push our way through another group of mercs hired by Barrett Company. This is one of those maps where one missed hit or buff or one well-timed crit will spell disaster for whichever side is on the wrong end of it. Uh, the first time we fight enemy summoners too, but the archers, as is a constant refrain in the game, can get quite annoying, so it's best to deal with them first. When the battle ends, we get a cutscene back in Igro's castle with Dystar and old Gaffy Boy. Dystar is upset that Ovelia isn't dead yet, big shocker there, and Gafgarian asks, what of Ramza? And like all good drama that has ever existed or will ever exist, the weight of the drum always pairs well with a nice glass of booze. Dystar pours himself a glass of wine, savors the moment, and says Ramza is too stubborn for his own good. Uh -oh. If he gets in the way, his life is forfeit. Gafgarian then asks about the Cardinal and his potential alliance with Ovilia. Dystark has already addressed that potentiality, however. Old Gaffy Boy also wonders why Dystark would hire such a buffoon to fumble the kidnapping, but Dystark confirms the original conspirators were found dead in the woods near the monastery, and that someone, cough, Delita, cough, cough, has gotten wind of their plots. They best be careful from now on. Finally, with Ovilia and Mustadio in tow, we arrive at Lionel Castle the high seat of the Order of the Northern Sky. Our party meets up with Cardinal Delacroix, head of the Church of Glabados, and we tell him all that has transpired. He agrees to expose Duke Larg and promises amnesty for Ovelia, and she is allowed to stay inside the castle as she sees fit. In a double whammy of goodness, the Cardinal also agrees to send aid to gouge and stop Barrett, but he wants to know why they are so ardent in pursuit. Mustadio is rightfully hesitant to give the reason why, the Zodiac Stone, but then the Cardinal reveals he has one of his own, a blood-red gem he lays upon the table. He and Ovelia tell us the legend of the Zodiac Braves. Long ago, before the earth and continents held form, the Lukavi held dominion over the world. Eventually, twelve heroes came forward, including a woman called Saint Ajora, to challenge the Lukavi and defeat them, sending them back to their spirit world. Each hero bore a crystal of a house of the night sky, a constellation, and so in time became known as the Zodiac Braves. Anytime the world was threatened, the story goes, they would appear again and vanquish whatever evil needed vanquishing. The blood red ore site on the table in front of us is considered to be one of those legendary stones. The Cardinal assumes correctly that Mustadio has seen one of those stones beneath the ancient lost detritus of Gouge, and that is why Barrett pursues him and his father so. The Cardinal reaffirms his position of help and declares the church will wrest that stone from Barrett's hands. With that, we part ways with Agrius and Ovelia and head to Gouge to help Mustadio's pop. After some tavern missions and outfitting our units with new gear, we head to Chigolath Fenlands, the only node between us and Gouge. Remember when I uh, hyped up Seal Evil, the special skill of Mustadio's? Well, here is the first time in the game where we will be allowed to use it and to frightening effect. The ability alone could single-handedly route the enemy units, but as I do, I try to squeeze out as much JP as I can and play with the enemy team as long as I can, at least before I get bored enough and want to move on. This map is a bitch, no two ways about it. Probably one of my least favorite maps in the game. All water in this map is befouled and will poison you upon ending your turn in it, and there are several tiles of water which are considered deep and will prevent any action or reaction occurring. You'll almost be fully submerged with just your little tiny pixel head peeking through the muck. It'd be kind of cute if it weren't so annoying. Also, the ghosts in this game have teleport, which ignores all height and range requirements, so they can bunker your units very easily if you're not careful. This is especially apparent and lethal in the late game. In any case, I do good work and win the battle and head to gouge. 
In Gouge, Mustadio notices no sign of struggle or battle from any of Barrett's units or of Lionel's. That's curious. Mustadio needs to investigate further and tells us to meet him later. We push farther into the lower belly of the city at the requested rendezvous point, but as we wait, Mustadio never comes. Then, Ludovic reveals himself and the captured Mustadio, and it seems we have fallen into a trap. All he wants is the ore site, and so Mustadio tells us where it is so we can fetch it for Ludovic. When we toss it over to him, of course, Ludovic reneges on his promise of freedom and orders his units to kill us all. So we must battle, as is our want in this game. The map is a cool one, and I love the dilapidated rain-soaked steeple we begin on and the general vibe of this place. It's not a hard battle, even when appropriately leveled and geared, but every once in a while, the enemy thieves might use Steel Heart, an ability that charms an enemy unit to fight for their side, and that can have disastrous effects if it succeeds enough. But Generally speaking, like all maps, take care of the archers first if you can, and all should be well. Not too hard, really. After the battle, we free Mustadio's father, and he tells us of Ludovic's plan with the Orosite, the Holy Stone of the Zodiac Braves. He wants to use the stone as a power source for the ancient machines that lie dormant under the city to build a weapon and an army. But the ever-crafty Mustadio pulled a fast one on Ludovic and gave him a replica stone, and in fact had the real stone on him the whole time. And you may have guessed, especially in a JRPG, the church was behind the whole thing, and Cardinal Delacroix was working with Ludovic the whole time. And now that he has a fake stone, Ovelia and Agrius are in danger of his wrath. So we must go and save them. With our new resolve, Mustadio formally joins our ranks, and we must away by boat to the port city of Wargelis, on the southern peninsula of the continent. QFMV. Cogs and gulls. No hint of Lionel's griffins. Delita. What brings you to watch us? We have ears in many places. Few things escape our hearing. Our? I say this for your sake, Ramza. Return to Egros. Delve no deeper into matters of royal maidens or those of sacred stones. What have these ears of yours been telling you? You think to save a princess from a burning tower. In truth, you would but set her on a higher floor. There is only one person who can truly save her. And that is what I mean to do. Just what do you imply? It's simple, really. Noble endeavors do not always reach the end that we desire. You cannot save the princess. However hard you endeavor to save her, you would do well to remember that. What then is your end in all of this, Delita? I fear I do not know. The Dukes Larg and Goltana, your brothers and all the rest. They are all of them swept up in a mighty current. A current they cannot see or feel. I simply swim against it. Nothing more. We'll meet again, I should hope. Delita once again presumes much of our story, and even tells Ramza as much. Everyone is caught in a current they cannot escape, and all Delita wants is to swim against it. Ramza seems more the stone slowly being weathered away by the water, and I suspect Delita knows this of the stubborn Ramza, and even admires it. Ramza does what he knows is right and just, and does so as the stalwart stone brooked by neither current nor ambition. His path is that of the true knight of the true hero. Delita wants the world to be different. He wants to play the hero, but that's the thing. He knows that everything is a game of sorts. The tragedies of his life are principled on this, and just because you refuse to play their game does not mean one isn't playing a game of their own. 
Even though Delita is on the path of transgression and change, he is still bound by the rules of a game, of a system, and I think he realizes that. It feels like he wants to admit this to Ramza, and almost does in a way, but Delita also knows that it wouldn't change either's path. The true endgame has yet to even reveal itself. Speaking of, in the dark interior of the Cardinal's office, we see three men of ill repute discussing their ploys. Gafgarian, Delacroix, and Ludovic. The Cardinal and Dystark have a pact involving the trade of Princess Ovilia, and he has set a trap for our party, two birds and a stone, as it were. Gafgarian, as usual, is contemplative and cautious, as he admits, and says it's a risky play, but the Cardinal is sure that it is the right move, and will lay a trail of crumbs to ensure our party gets their due invitation. Gafgarian takes his leave, and the Cardinal takes umbrage with Ludovic and his failures, by killing him horribly. Turnover is high in the business of schemes, apparently. In Belize Swale, or Belize Valley, where the first of St. Azor's disciples hid from a pursuing ancient empire thousands of years prior, we find our old friend Agrius being pursued by Knights of Lionel. How fitting. Ramza happens upon her and we help her destroy the pursuing enemy. Again, take care of the archers first if you're playing this ethically and not overleveled like I am, and be careful of the black mages, but otherwise it's an easy map and it should cause little problems. During and after the battle, Agris informs us of the Cardinal's treachery and that Ovelia was once again captured, and is now readied for execution at Golgolata Gallows. A few miles north of Belai Swale, our party breaches Golgolata Gallows, an infamous place of death where St. Azor was first executed, just in time to witness the preamble to Avilia's own execution. But as you might have guessed, and as the Cardinal literally just told us, it was a trap all along, and Gafgarian reveals himself as the executioner, and the princess as… Uh, an archer. It's always the goddamn archer. Ramza, ever the gallant fool, falls headfirst into danger, and now we, the player, must dig ourselves out of this bloody hole. This fight is one of the many in the game that teaches you the importance of turns and turn order, and how if you're not careful or if the enemy gets lucky, the fight can very quickly devolve into failure. The archers, yet again, are the prime annoyance here, but Gafgarian should be handled first and foremost if possible, but not without first stealing his very rare equipment, Bloodsword, which is one of the only two copies in the entire game. Bloodsword, a somewhat reoccurring weapon in Final Fantasy games, allows whatever damage it inflicts to absorb back as health points. It's quite nice. But once you damage old Gaffy Boy enough, he'll teleport away and leave your units to clean up the rest of the enemy squad. You start the battle with a split party, and two of your units hide under the ramparts of the gallows. This is a double-edged sword because it allows any magic units you have to cast spells relatively unimpeded and without having to move much, but this also rings true for the enemy time mages who will annoy you with slow or immobilize, so caution is advised. However, before we remove Gafgarian from the battle, he tells Ramza that Dystarg would surely forgive him if he just comes back to Egros, but Ramza denies the plea. Gafgarian reminds Ramza of his house and station, and Ramza wishes no part in this foulness of these plots. Old Gaffy Boy still has some wisdom buried in his ashen mustache, however, and states that blood is the price of progress, and it is the ink which history is writ. I mean, he makes this point on top of gallows, for God's sake. To wit, a concerted group and effort had to discover the stone, mark and cut the stone, transport the stone, and finally place the stones in such a way to fortify a structure meant to execute people for either being violent criminals or worse, and more probably yet, people of opposition, of unwanted ideas and beliefs, as it were. An industry and system of blood literally surrounds everyone and is a constant reminder of the price of progress. The irony that Ramza cannot fathom yet consistently appalls Gafgarian and previously Argith, for he is a man of blood, of price and penny, and he says Ivalis rots from within. It desires and requires these blood sacrifices, this change, and Ramza's brother is likely to be the delta for this, even if it means to sully his hands in the morality of House Bale. It's a sharp truth that cuts deeply and Ramza will soon realize the price of such scarring. Back at Lionel Castle, Delita washes over Avilia in a dungeon, begging her to eat. She accuses him of being in league with the Cardinal, but Delita denies it, and so she asks what he would do with her, and he says to put her where she rightly belongs. Ovelia keenly answers back that 
she's to be used by Delita as well then. Delita rather coldly and accurately tells her she needs to do as he says if she wishes to survive. Before he can explain what that means, the Cardinal and the same Purple Knight from Dorter enter the dungeon. The Cardinal would let her out if she is calmer and more pliable, but the Purple Knight does not play the obsequious host and tells her the dungeon is a perfect place for a false princess. Remember, Ovelia is adopted after all. Ovelia is confused though and does not get what he means so he tells her. The original princess died many years ago and that Ovelia is and was her double. It was why she was adopted in the first place. He calls her a straw doll, meant to placate the council because they held no love for the queen and she was a tool used to limit the queen's influence and power. The council plotted and succeeded in killing the queen's two eldest sons as the ailing king was unlikely to have another son, but against all odds he did father another son, the infant Ornus. And in that moment the council's plot failed and it was all for naught. However, the purple knight seems unfazed by these plots and makes known they hold a trump card and that there are even bigger stakes at play. They may hold her prisoner, but they do want Ovilia to ascend the throne. The Purple Knight admits they are not of Goltana's banner, nor are they friends to Duke Larg. They are a third party, wholly with their own goals. The Cardinal finally gives name to the Purple Knight, Lord Fulmarv, and says to take their leave until the princess comes around. It appears they are part of the deeper goings on behind the scenes of this civil war. In the PSP version of Tactics, not only do we receive new units and jobs and a revised script and full motion video cutscenes, we also get new in-game cutscenes that flesh out some motivations for certain characters. One of these is in Linalian Plateau, the place of his sister's death, where we witness Wegraf at the grave of Maluda. Wegraf laments on his impotence as a soldier and failure as a commander and vows vengeance to those that killed her. A blue knight who looks rather similar to Lord Fulmarv interjects and Wegraf draws his blade. However, the blue knight does not wish to cross swords with such a warrior and instead has an offer. He introduces himself as Lawfrey and his purpose is to recruit Wegraf into his company's fold. Wegraf thinks him a bounty hunter, but Lawfrey appeals to the unsettled emotion of Wegraf's losses of his sister and his corpse brigade and says his group's ambition is to uproot the foundation of Ivalis as well and see that she is not twice made a slave to nobility. This sounds very familiar. Lawfrey remarks that Wegraf has spirit and desire and passion burning through him and that they would welcome such things to their self-same cause. There's that control motif again and even Wegraf recognizes this and states that he is to be used. Lawfrey, being a fan of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead as well, it seems, states that every coin has two faces and would it not be prudent to consider the other face. Join them, he tells Wegraf, and their power would be his to wield. Wegraf alone does not have the power to change the world as he wants. Wegraf gazes at the monolith to his failed ambitions at the grave of his sister and decides quietly to agree to Lawfrey's bargain. And so begins our journey to the end of chapter 2 at the gates of Lionel Castle. Ramza squirrels his way through the gate to the opposite side in order to let his troops move in, but Gafgarian shows up one last time to impede him. This is the first taste of multi-part battles where, if you were like me back in the day and only ever used one save slot, this could be a legit moment of GG, of breaking your progress and forcing you to restart the game entirely because you were unprepared for the fights ahead. That being said, this battle, even in my overpowered state, is a testament to why the tactics subgenre is so desired. It's a bit of masochism mixed with RNG and preparation and a whole lot of trial and error. This fight is tough, no two ways about it. Now I could use auto potion and dragon heart or ignore height and or jump, or I could straight up blitz down Gafgarian with pure dual wielding sword power, or I could just use arithmetics and instantly kill everything, like vanishing and then X zoning if you will. But I decided to just leave it as is, at least for the first fight anyway, and come as I am. A wonky team build with little survivability and hope for the best. Since there is nothing rare to steal from Gafgarian this time, I ditched that strategy and just putz around with Ramza as a dual wielding black mage. Old Gaffy boy will always have the first attack, so you'll start at a disadvantage, but you'll have another option available. To the left of the gate, there is a not so noticeable tile that if you end your turn on, will allow you to open the gate and let your other units come in to beat on Gafgarian too. 
This is the intended tactic, but I ignore it this time around and go 1v1. My dancers and bards brutalize the other enemy knights and archers and summoners, and I mostly toy with them, even if Ramza is getting pieced up by old Gaffy boy. Eventually, I kill Gafgarian for real this time, and we can advance inside the castle proper and to rescue the Princess Ovilian. But wait, there's more, says the PSP version of Final Fantasy Tactics. We get a new battle with Princess Ovelia and Delita back at Zirshil Falls. Ovelia and Delita are on their way to Zeltania to meet up with their mysterious third party. Ovelia remarks that this was the place where Delita first promised to make sure she was never used again as a tool for power. Delita evades this accusation and reminds Ovelia that she really has no choice in the matter. <laughs> Some knights show up and try to thwart Delita's escape with the princess, so we must do battle. I feel like this was an odd choice of a new battle because it really has no importance on the story or plot, nor is it in any way difficult, and there are only three enemy units to kill and Delita is absurdly more powerful than any of them. Along with Ovelia's godlike protective magic, this fight is perfunctory at best. When I kill the final enemy unit, Delita once again gives Ovelia an ultimatum, bemoan her fate and remain static or take his hand and live. She really has no other alternative, so she acquiesces. Again, we already knew this, so not really sure why Square decided to include this specific battle, but there we are. After learning some abilities and preparing for the final battle of Chapter 2, I set up my units and get ready for a very tough battle inside Lionel Castle Oratory. Cardinal Delacroix stands behind a stone pulpit, ready to give his final sermon of death as it were, but not without first jabbing at the memory of Gafkarian and his blustering. Or maybe it's because Ramza is such a badass, even if his stock was thinned by the blood of a whore, he says. Them's fighting words where I come from. However, as if in the Ivalisian air, much like Delita, the Cardinal gives us an ultimatum as well, to leave the Orsite with him and then leave Lionel, or suffer the consequences. His last such offer. Ramza wants Ovilia all the same, and Delacroix says not Will alone can let Ramza have what he's after. Even Will requires force, and he has none. Still, the Cardinal tells us to go to Zeltenia, and that Ovilia has accepted this mysterious third party's help, joining their cause. Ramza doesn't believe it, obviously, but the Cardinal tries to sweeten the deal, and even asks Ramza to join them, perhaps in a quest for vengeance against his brothers. The Cardinal's group wants to change Ivalice on the whole, but Ramza does not. He only wants to stop evil where he can. In a rare occurrence of clarity, Ramza denies such a quest as the Cardinal's, and says not even he is as naive to believe he alone can change the world. Our little lad is growing up, ain't he? The Cardinal scoffs at such ridiculous posturing and tells us plainly that the oarsight we hold can twist the very weave of nature itself, and he aims to show us. As Cardinal Delacroix holds the blood redstone above his head, dread spirits of the Lukavi circle above him and clamor in ghoulish laughter. Then the spirits swim into the body of the Cardinal, and in a powerful blast of demonic magics, the once portly man of the cloth transforms into a Cronenbergian hell beast, an even fatter creature from the depths of nightmares, Kukulin the Impure. Here it is, the real threat of the game, the true enemy that uses the civil unrest in the kingdom of Ivalis for its own deleterious ends. And the power is actually real, all the old stories were true. For the first time of many, we are about to battle one of the Lukavi from the time of the Zodiac Braves. And what a battle it is. The music, the sound design, the map, the story and lore implications, and certainly the battle itself. It's the first time in the game where no matter your party level or makeup, Kukulin will absolutely wreck you. It's also perfectly expressed and shows that even a slow, laborious genre, such as tactics games are, can still give you the sweaty palms and quicken pulse. So, to start, the placement of your units before the battle can be crucial. Depending on your job setup, and even in my Super Saiyan team state, I had to restart the battle twice. Actually, no, three times, and changed some jobs around, and still barely won by the skin of my teeth. As the battle starts, Kukulin will immediately use his multi-target instant ability, Nightmare, that will apply Doom and Sleep, guaranteed to hit unless you have items that prevent these status effects. And he does this by opening his stitched belly, revealing a gaping, gnashing, razor-tooth-filled mouth that screeches profane words as its magic. His opening salvo can potentially win the fight for him instantly, so it's best to have your units placed in such a way that can only really ever target two of them at most. I'd suggest using the barrette accessory you could have taken from Avilia when she was in your party, or the defense armlet, which both prevent sleep, as that's the real party killer here. Doom is annoying, surely, but at least you can still act and put on damage before the timer goes off and kills you. The second of Kukulin's abilities that he will use to great effect is Biora, or Biora, or Biora, or Brara, or 
whatever, which has a few different nasty uh, status effects, one of the worst being Petrify, and he can cast it quickly and basically anywhere on the map. His third ability to round out his nightmarish tool belt is Fallow Heart, a single target ability that disables and stops an enemy unit. This also has effectively an infinite range, so trying to outmaneuver the fat demon is nigh impossible in this fight. Oh, and he packs quite a wallop with his high damage physical attacks too. The best strategy here is to fight fire with fire. If Kukulin wishes to win by vicious attrition, then so must we. It's best to not care if a unit needs to be healed or kept alive. We must full press into the fat demon and break him before he breaks us. Sometimes the enemy AI will just toy with you and pick you apart and there's not a goddamn thing you can do about it, but sometimes the enemy AI will go full YOLO and just let you beat on him mercilessly as he aggressively beaches himself at your party's feet. For my final attempt, attempt number five I think, I decided not to play nice anymore and turned Ramza back into a dual wielding knight. Kukulin has a small HP pool and low physical defense, so it's best to have some heavy hitters on the squad to take him down quickly. In addition to having my Lady Monk throw heavy hands and my Samurai Buddy rounding out the team along with my heavy magic hitter, the White Slash Black Mage, misses, I eventually bashed that fat team in good until he could no longer take it and died in a blast of demonic magic, going out just as he came in. After the fight in Zeltenia Castle Keep, Dalita informs Du Goltana of the Southern Sky that he has provided him with Princess Ovelia. Dalita introduces himself in his bona fides, flanked by the Southern Sky's council and a particular knight known as Sid, and informs the Duke that he has a prisoner with him. A prisoner with information involving a certain plot. The prisoner tells the council there about a turncoat midst their ranks, a close advisor who wants to curry favor with Duke Lark. Chancellor Glavane seems panicked and disavows such heresy and quickly demands the prisoner to be silent. Surprise, surprise, then, that the prisoner names his patron as Chancellor Glavane and that he gave him the order to capture the princess. Delita, in a performance for the ages, calls out the Chancellor as a traitor. The Chancellor protests, of course, but the evidence speaks for itself, and Delita runs him through and secures his allegiance to Duke Coltana. I love how Sid also readies his hand on his blade, but in a way that suggests a much calmer demeanor. For, as we will understand in the game at some point, that man Sid could single handedly take out an army. Delita begs for Duke Coltana to finally take action and formally declare war on Lazalia, on the Order of the Northern Sky, and so formally begins the War of the Lions, the Great Civil War of Ivalice. Fast forward a bit to Fort Besselat, and we find Duke Goltana, Thunder God Sid, the Marquis Elmdor de Limberry, the Baron of Bolmina, and Viscount Blanche all in a meeting to discuss the ongoing civil war. They take inventory of the dead and dying, the wounded, and it seems the toll is heavy on both sides, almost unusually so. Not only does war threaten the land, but drought as well. Because there are little wares to be sold through the southern kingdom, taxes are low, and so the coin needed to operate such a war is quickly dwindling. In the northern kingdom, excessive rain rotted the crops before harvest, so it seems all sides are beset with death. Not to mention what little work there would be in any case for the common folk. Sid smartly suggests to sue for peace, but Duke Goltana wishes no end to the war, regardless of reason. He even goes as far as to call Sid a coward for such talk. The council agrees with the Duke, and they think the war is almost at an end anyway, so may as well win it. Duke Goltana is disappointed in Sid and his wariness, and there seems to be a growing divide between them. Where would such a well-known hero of the Great Fifty Years' War brook a quarter if not in his own kingdom then? If Duke Larg and Duke Goltana are so hellbent on such a bloody and destructive war, why does this mysterious third party want them to be in conflict so badly. It seems things are spiraling out of control on all fronts, and Ivalice is to bear the weight of it. What vast current propels these plots? Only time and blood will tell. We begin chapter 3 of the game by buying some fresh gear and making sure our units are up to snuff, in addition to going around to every town, castle, port, and completing various tavern missions. Eventually, I think by the end of chapter 3, I won't be overleveled anymore, so the game's difficulty curve will be more or less the intended pace. I'm trying to juice my units up as much as I can because I want to use the only non-story characters as much as I can, so I want to make them as viable and therefore strong as I can.
The game will feed you a very few powerful story units, as I mentioned before, and you could easily end up only using those units and never anyone else, so to make the game a bit more interesting, I will avoid that as much as possible. And speaking of powerful story units you encounter, our first map of Chapter 3 is with one of these very units, at the snow-laced rooftops of the mining town Goland. This is quite the important city, as we will discover later in the game, and will be a pivotal point in one of the game's biggest side quests. But, for now, we are to attempt a sort of rescue of a young man, a young astrologer, by the name of Oren Durai. Hey, there's that name again. Remember way back about an hour and a half ago, when I mentioned that our curator and de facto narrator's name was also Durai? Well, here he is, the great, 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 well, an undisclosed number of greats, great-grandfather. Oren is being chased by a gang of thieves after it seems he's been poking around in their hideout. For what, we don't know, but we happen upon him as he escapes and the enemy units decide we need to die as well. Hot off the battle with a literal demon god, these paltry knaves have no idea what's about to happen to them. I mean, not only is my party steeled with resolve and metal and power, but Oren is about as busted and OP of a character that this game has on offer. He's an astrologer, a unique job that only he has, and he has one ability that is absurdly powerful. And when I saw it for the first time, way back in the late 90s, my little kid mind ran with thought as I wondered when and if I was ever going to be able to recruit him or get his job at some point. Rightfully though, Squaresoft recognized that despite units like Sid or Beowulf, or Ramza for that matter, some things are just beyond the pale, some things are just too much to give away. Orn has an ability called Galaxy Stop, the original name for the PlayStation guys, or Celestial Stasis, the new name for the PSP players, and it is just simply ridiculous. Not only is it relatively fast, not too fast though, it can hit every enemy on the map, much like a dancer or mathematician can, and inflicts three extremely debilitating status effects. Stop, don't act, and don't move. Or in other words, stop, disable, and immobilize. It's just crazy that such an ability exists in-game, and this is, for obvious reasons, one of my favorite battles in the game. Not only is the bell effect pretty cool when it hits, you just have to laugh at how easy the battle becomes. Also, Orin's gold and black sprite is fantastic, so there's simply no downside to this map and battle. In addition to our first meeting of a truly OP character in battle, we are also introduced to our first meeting of the book weapon type, as well as the mediator job, whom also uses a book as a weapon. For knowledge is power. Take a look, it's in a book. The book is a mid-ranged weapon type that allows a unit to bypass a lot of height requirements for attacks by beating down their enemies with pure logic and facts. Technically, I was already exposed to this as some shops sell books and rugs and bags, and yes, these are weapon types in the game. Apparently, someone at Squaresoft must have had a very traumatic experience in a library at some point, but it's the first time in the game where the enemy will use them. In any case, after the battle ends, Ramza and Oren exchange info, and Oren seems surprised by the last name of Ramza, which suggests he may know of him, but either way, they part ways and wish each other good fortune, and we can move north into the royal city of Lazalia, the high seat and capital of Ivalice. In Lazalia, we find Zalbag Bael, Lord Brother and Ark Knight and leader of the Northern Sky. Reading or studying in a private library within the castle, he's surprised to see Ramza all the way in Lazalia, and also states that Alma is there as well and Ramza should see her. Ramza, however, is on a mission of morality and attempts to deter Zalbag from war once again, stating how their house is built on justice and not glory, such as this civil war seems to be about, and that there seems to be a hidden hand among the war. Zalbag doesn't like the insinuation and denies Ramza's appraisal, and becomes indignant at the accusation of treachery within his own house and from his own brother, no less. Zalbag even goes as far as to insult Ramza and his common blood mother, it seems to be a, a common jape against him, and says he is no brother of his and that Ramza should head back to Egros if he knows what's good for him. Ramza is taken aback by the hostility, but before the argument can continue, a knight from the northern sky rushes in to tell the Lord Commander that Thunder God Sid has broken their lines at Dugera Pass. Zalbag must summon his war council and then leaves to play commander. I suspect that Zalbag reacts so strongly to the allegations against his brother and Duke because not only does it stain the memory of their stalwart and just father and the true justice their house has always stood for, but he himself had been having these thoughts and suspicions, and the truth always hits hard and cold, especially when you don't want to face it. In the back of the castle, the postern, 
Ramza attempts to leave without having talked to his sister Alma, but Alma finds him before he can. Ramza has never been good at goodbyes and so relents and tells Alma of the goings on. He tells her that Delita lives and that he is part of something that is of neither side of the civil war, something perhaps more dangerous still. Alma is no dummy either and suspects that Dystarg indeed ordered the failed abduction and then asks about Tietra. Ramza admits to her death and Alma is beside herself. That was her best friend, remember. Ramza also admits that Delita serves a purpose that is unknown to him and he doesn't believe what he is doing, he is doing without reasons. That's not who or what Delita is. Alma correctly guesses that Ramza is on a path of justice and so decides to follow in his footsteps and join Ramza's cause. Ramza protests, of course, but not before a man of Glabidos enters the scene. High Confessor Zalmor of the Holy Inquisition has been tasked to take the heretic Ramza on charges of murder of the Cardinal Delacroix. Oh yeah, that bit. While technically true, Ramza has no intention of going into the custody of the obviously corrupt church and so denies such a request. To the church, however, resisting arrest is tantamount to pleading guilty and therefore means a just and quick execution is wholly appropriate. Backing the High Confessor are some holy monks and knights and suddenly we are thrust into battle. Our goal is to just damage the High Confessor enough so he teleports away, which isn't too hard but the old man has quite a bit of powerful white magics in his arsenal and so if you're not careful and you decide to rag on the other units instead of Zalmor, you might find yourself in a Sisyphusian uphill battle which will eventually end in defeat. So go hard on Zalmor as soon as possible and the fight will be much more manageable. But as it is, I toy with the units as long as possible, turning some into crystals so I can absorb and learn some of their job abilities and really have no trouble at all with this map. During the fight, Zalmor says we are heretics to commit such heinous acts against the church, but Ramza attempts to explain that it was all a deceit from the outset and that the church is corrupt by an ancient magical evil, the Lukavi. Zalmor, being a true believer, denies such audacity and calls for the name of Baal to be washed away in tears. That point might have more truth in it than either realize. After the battle, Ramza and Alma discuss the Aura site and she says she may have seen one of these stones in Orbone Monastery. She will show Ramza but she must be allowed to stay with him in the interim. Ramza protests, of course, but Alma points out that she's probably considered an apostate or heretic as well and she may as well join their party. Besides, how else would he even get close to Orbone without her help, considering Ramza is pursued and branded a criminal too. Fair is fair, and so we make our way back to Orbone Monastery. But first, I must go around the entire map and do all the tavern missions at all the towns and cities and upgrade my units. This may take a while and does, especially if you're doing it without save states, but lucky for me in this video, it will magically only take a few seconds or a minute at most. It's like time traveling, but only for you. At Orbone Monastery, we begin the first of a three battle sequence. In the first level of the vaults where one of the zodiac stones is supposedly kept, Elder Simon takes a nap with his fellow white mages but wakes up just in time and lets us know that men have come looking for the stone. The Virgo stone was indeed housed here and it was a stone of royal lineage, given as proof that the foster child of Vilia was of royal blood. Ramza correctly guesses why he is branded a heretic. It is because he possesses some of these holy stones and the church, for whatever reason, want them badly. Elder Simon reveals that High Confessor Marcel wishes to restore the church to prominence with these stones. He says the church has been orchestrating the conflict between Goltana and Larg to whittle down their military power. Surprised Pikachu face. Marcel and the church wish to re-establish themselves as the de facto power in Ivalice by weakening the crown and winning the people over. Oh, and uh, by infusing themselves with the unholy magic power of the Lukavi. Don't forget that little bit. Ramza tasks Alma with hiding and protecting Elder Simon. In response, Alma wishes she was a man in this moment to charge into battle with Ramza at her side. However, Ramza just steamrolls over this rather delicate and powerful realization by saying it's nonsense and that what would he do without his little sister? Ah, to be a woman in the feudal times, eh? There's that control and agency theme again, rearing its sizable and ugly head. On to the second level of the monastery vaults, our first battle. A green knight templar named Isolude, whose sprite looks very much like Lord Fulmar of Inlawfrey, commands his units to hold this passage as he searches for the stone in the farthest recesses of the monastery. And just in time too, our party shows up and decides to crash the enemy's position. This fight is actually pretty tough. The enemy units consist of three lancers, 
Dragoons for you Final Fantasy fanboys out there, and one chemist and two additional time mages at the bottom of the vault steps. Because the battlefield is so stratified, magic users are at a particular advantage here, considering their magic can ignore height issues on this map, and so the time mages will become quite annoying. This is the first map that shows off the power of lancers as well. Their job's ability allows them to jump in the air and land on enemies' head like Mario, and inflict high physical damage. The tactical and strategic part comes from the fact that the jump ability isn't immediate and that the unit will sort of hang in the air and disappear from the battlefield for a time until their action can be completed and they'll crash back down into the earth. Basically, it makes the unit invulnerable to damage and can be used quite effectively as a defensive tactic as well as an offensive one. This is nothing new. This has been the staple of the jump command in most of if not all of Final Fantasy games, but in Final Fantasy Tactics' particular combat system, one must first target a tile or a space on the map. This means that a unit could move out of the jump landing zone and not take damage, or it can mean that a unit can enter the same targeted tile space and then get hit by jump. It's a high risk, high reward kind of tactic, but in this particular battle, these Lancers will pump out some serious damage to my party, so I will need to be careful. Obviously, the jump command pairs very well with Time Mage's immobilized magic, hence why this enemy team makeup is rather effective, and the fight itself pretty difficult. That being said, I eventually deal with them all after some clutch raises and revives, and then I win the battle. In the third level of the Monastery Vaults, Isolude calls us mongrels and Ramza a heretic, and that he will have the stones we carry. Ramza gives him the same ultimatum, but he scoffs at that, and so we do battle. During the fight, Isolude asks Ramza why he persists in such foolish resistance, for he is a Baelv, but Ramza retorts it is because he is a Baelv that he persists. His name stands for truth and justice and the American way. No, no, wait, sorry, that, that's a different game. Uh, his family fought the 50 years war for the exact same reason he now stands in opposition of the crown and church, to deny the corruption and self-serving aristocracy. Isolude suggests Ramza join them for they fight for the same goals. Isolude thinks the church of Glapidos envisions a world devoid of hierarchy and class where all men are equal. And considering the realization of Alma in the previous scene, this expressed desire seems particularly empty, or at least misguided. He says Saint Ajora said this exact same thing eons past and names him, which is odd again considering we know she's a woman. Religion and facts name a better combo, yeah? Isolude wants to reclaim the course of Ivalice, but Ramza rightly says it is his group that churned the waves of this conflict. Isolude, like any good devotee of a cause, immediately suggests martyrdom <laughs> as the proper course of action, and that revolution requires it, that the crown and old ways of life are rotten. He asks once again for Ramza to join their cause, as Delita has, but Ramza does not answer him directly. He instead suggests that they want, and by extension what anybody in their stead would want, is power, and power that beyond an army, even. They would free the people just to enslave them again via demonic magic? Seems quite the stretch to claim that as emancipation from corruption. It seems to be the definition of it, if anything. However, Isolud still believes the stones are of God and that they are vessels for divinity. Ramza denies Isolud's notion and says the cardinal was changed into one of these Lukavi, but Isolud rebukes Ramza's counterclaim. And so goes the carousel of true believers, of the circular thought of delusion and dogma. Though it matters not, for soon there will be a reckoning and the truth will be known. When we weaken Isolud enough, he flees and the battle will end. This fight is also quite hard. If your units do not have enough jump and move stats, the winding paths of the narrow vault archways will force the enemy to whittle you down without you even being able to touch them. Not only is there an annoying archer you must deal with, but the hard-hitting monks and knights round out the even harder-hitting Isolude. Because all you have to do is weaken Isolude to end the battle, the best defense is of course a good offense, so going full press on him is advisable. But if you have enough defensive magics and feel like having some masochistic fun, you can try and chew through the enemy units one by one until only Isolude is left like I opted to do for whatever reason. Sometimes we gotta make our own fun where we can. And now we are at our final battle, at the place where we started the first level of the Monastery Vaults. As is the constant refrain for these three battles, this one is also very tough. Isolude has captured Alma, it seems, and wouldn't you know it, our old adversary Wegref has shown up and orders Isolude to take the girl and go. Wegref at least shows us the proper respect and says not to be deceived by Ramza's youth, that he is indeed a worthy foe. Boy, is this battle quite the pickle. 
Looking back on it, this battle really is the preamble to the final fight with Weegraf a bit later. It should teach you how to position your units so as not to die in the opening gambit, as well as reaffirming that Weegraf's such devastation is indeed his intention, and that you must respect the enemy. Weegraf will hit at least two of your units right off the bat, there's no way around that, so you must position them in a way that allows minimal damage and easy restoration. Hopefully he won't stop any of your units because this will effectively lose the battle before you can even get to issue any commands. Uh, after Weegraf uses Stasis Blade on a couple of our units, he converses with Ramza. Ramza calls Weegraf a thrall of the church, doing its bidding, an ignoble end for such a iconoclast as he was, Weegraf disabuses Ramza of this notion, saying he knows nothing of his dreams and ambitions. Only power can realize such dreams, power that he now possesses. Such biting words are sucker to him, it matters not. Ramza will have no choice but to yield to such power, and if by that he means that I have to restart the fight a few times, rearrange some units and jobs and whatnot, then yes, you are right, Weegraf. I will have to succumb to such power. Flanking Weegraf are, yet again, of course, a couple of archers who will snipe at you from the thin doorways on either side of the map, and a couple of black mages who pack quite the punch, so this fight in all ways is quite the battle. If you wish to go after units and crystal them for their sweet, sweet, delicious job ability juices, this fight will be exceptionally difficult as you'll have to evade and tank and heal from Weegraf's Holy Knight onslaught. Not to mention the constant heavy barrage from the archers and black mages. It's a very claustrophobic fight as well. Thin alleyways and even thinner openings to egress, there's just not much room to run or outflank anyone. Fighting will happen and it will be done in close quarters and with haste. So even here, it is best to fight fire with fire, press hard into Weegraf to end the fight as soon as possible. Most likely you will lose some units, so you have to end the battle before they turn into crystals and therefore don't feel bad about throwing your units into the wood chipper to just squeeze out a little more damage where you can. This tactic will be employed in many more battles, mind you, so best to get used to that now and forgive yourself for the wanton disregard of your party. After finally damaging Weegraf enough, he flees and the battle is won, and we witness a rather sad scene outside the entrance to Orbone Monastery. Outside the monastery, Isolude holds Alma atop Chocobo, very reminiscent of Gragoroth and Tietra, if you remember, and a prone, bleeding, dying Weegraf orders for Isolu to escape with her. On a quick note, I love how Weegraf's portrait is now bleeding from the mouth and head, a very Doom-like addition that adds a lot of character, I think. Again, the original PlayStation had severe memory limits and therefore limited ways the developer could design the game. So to even see just a little ketchup on the side of Weegraf's mouth really does add to the feel and immersion of the scene. Perhaps it's just me, but I do enjoy the subtle and small details sometimes more than anything else. Regardless, Weegraf once again laments his impotence as a soldier and asks for Maluda's forgiveness. It is a bitter drink to swallow for such a man as he, so much left undone and may be forgotten. As he slumps over, the zodiac stone spills from his coat and falls beyond his reach. Then, the stone lifts into the air above either Ramza and Weegraf, and shines and then speaks. The voice calls him a god stone bearer, and asks for treaty. The flesh and stone will become as one, forever alive and immutable. The stone seems to react strongly to the emotion of the moment. It comes alive from the ire and despair of Weegraf, of its bearer. At the same moment as Weegraf agrees to the stone's want, Ramza pleads with Weegraf not to. But it is too late. The Gigas Belias has answered the desire of its bearer and so imbues Weegraf with the fearsome power of the Lukavi, transforming the once proud man into a currish, four-armed hell beast with horns. Weegraf, or Belias as it is now, finally understands the power of the Orsite, power that can truly change things. He now sees with eyes thousands of years old. The Weegraf we knew is now gone, or more accurately, has ascended into something new and terrifying. Belias teleports away after he laughs at Ramza when he draws his blade. Elder Simon then crawls from within the monastery to give us a book, the Book of Germanique, one of St. Azura's apostles. Elder Simon repents as he knows his end is near and says he lived a life of sin knowing that the church rotted from within as he turned a blind eye to it. The book may expose the church for its misdeeds and indeed save Alma from their twisted goals. In his last bittersweet breath, Elder Simon remarks how Ramza truly is the spitting image of young Barbaneth, Ramza's father. At Trade City Dorter, rain soaks the streets as Ramza moves through them. Suddenly, a young man blocks Ramza's path. He identifies himself with the church and says if he wants Alma back, he must come to Riovane Castle with the heretical scriptures of Germanique. And with that, the young man disappears and we find ourselves with a new path to tread.
So here you are. They've been searching high and low for you. I do hope this day finds your royal highness in better spirits than those past. Do not mock me. Please. I could not bear it. That was cruel of me. I am sorry. What do you mean to do with me? I am not Ovelia. There can be no value in holding me. No value even in my living. <laughs> You're right. You are not the Princess Ovelia. We do not even know your rightful name. Whether even you be highborn or low. I had often wondered. Of the royal family, why must I alone be confined to a remote monastery so far removed from the seat of our crown? Even this I thought a burden light enough, if it meant the kingdom would know peace. I played my part, yet still Ivelisse runs red with blood. All this suffering and solitude. For what? It has been the same for me. I was given the wardrobe of a nobleman, and so I played the part, a puppet ever dancing for the amusement of patrons unseen. This wretched world does not reward endeavor. It is the patron and his troop who are receipt. Maggots grown fat on endeavor's course. Most men but play the part they're given. Most live and die not knowing they play a part at all. But I am past all that now. I am their unwitting puppet. No more! No more. I will exact from them the price of their gluttonous feast! And just what is it you plan to do to them? I will burn down this kingdom, and from its ashes build for you a new one, a kingdom worthy of you. I will show you a world where your light will outshine the sun, a world that will know no darkness. And you will have no more need of tears. Such a world is possible. I will not fail you in this. On Titra's soul, I swear it to you. Dry your tears. Ovelia plays the princess in the tower well enough, but she desires it no further, and Delita is one of the same mind. Because Ovelia reminds him so much of his dead sister, Tietra, he promises all things he could never have given her to Ovelia instead. From deep trauma and personal loss, the realm of Ivelisse will forever be changed. True, there may be an existential apocalyptic threat, as is the want in such video games and fantasy stories, but the motivation for such enduring change is to come from those that need and wish it the most and not from those that simply feast on the meals of others and benefit sight unseen. Alone, Delita and Ovilia seem to have an accord, a pact, to wrest the reins of fate back into the hands of the common man. Still, Delita must play his part, as it is too soon to enact such goals or indeed even be able to see them clearly. Much still needs to be done. Bramza continues his journey back to Zaklaw's desert into a new battle, a new character, and a new side quest, all exclusive to the PSP version of Final Fantasy Tactics. You'll never be able to outrun them. Yeah. It's dead. 
leader you're after. I'll feed you a length of iron. Have it your way then. Here we are introduced to Luso, a young man with the job of Game Hunter. Luso is probably the best poacher in the game. The poach ability allows a unit to kill a monster slash beast and obtain their pelt in order to trade for valuable items in some of the town's shops. And because the Game Hunter job has the implicit ability of poach, it frees up a passive slot, thus making Luso inherently better at poaching than any other unit. Some of you may recognize the little yellow and red scamp as the main character from Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, the Game Boy Advance series of Final Fantasy Tactics. And while that game may not be as deep or impressive as the PlayStation variant, it was still quite the fun game and I sunk hundreds of hours into that as well which for a mobile game at the time in the early aughts was quite impressive. In addition to the poach implicit, Luso's game hunter job also has all the default abilities that Ramza has, which means Luso can learn Ultima eventually as well. The battle at Z-Claw's Desert is actually kind of fun because you can get some seriously powerful equipment if you let Luso poach all the behemoths, especially the Behemoth King and Dark Behemoth the tan one and dark blue one, respectively. One of these being the Stone Shooter, a gun that spits out random magic and can pump out a lot of damage, as well as a late game bow, the Artemis bow. If you can, let Luso go on murdering, but be warned, because he is a guest AI, he will do dumb shit and will not do what you want him to do. So patience in a white mage is a virtue here. I don't really care about the gear because I'm trying to curb some of the power I have, but also because the gun and bow can be collected later in higher random battles and from deep dungeon. So I don't really push as hard and long as I can to let Luso poach and end the battle rather quickly. After the battle, Luso formally joins our ranks, if you decide to let him that is, and we can be on our way to the next story mission. On a quick small spoilery note, there are quite a few secret characters in the game, and at least three of them are literally from different Final Fantasy games. There's Balthier, Luso, and Cloud. And yep, that Cloud, the one and only. In addition to those three, we also have Beowulf, Reese, and Construct 8. But those three are germane to this game, at least. This was a common practice back in the early days of Final Fantasy and RPGs in general that has fallen out of favor, unfortunately. In fact, in some older Final Fantasy games, certain characters were so secret that you could very easily never encounter them and essentially wonder why you kept getting weapons that none of your other characters could even use. UV, I'm looking at you. In any case, Ramza and company move on to Grog Heights, the largest farm belt in Lazalia region, which if you remember, has been beset by heavy rain and has sullen a lot of the crops that were bound for harvest and for the capital. And wouldn't you know it, it's raining as we arrive. We crash into some deserting soldiers. Again, the war is far too expensive and ongoing, and there is a lot of desertion and relocation going on, whom recognize us as the branded heretics and decide to turn us in for the bounty and to reclaim their honorable discharge and to evade any punishment for their desertion, I'd expect. This map is fantastic. It's open and easy and allows a great number of jobs to shine here. It's a great map to practice and to balance any mods for folks to cook up from the original game. And yes, there are quite the number of mods for Final Fantasy Tactics that deserve a whole 10 hour critique in and of themselves, but that's really for the diehards and would be beyond the pale for this video. And trust me, you can't call yourself a nerdy diehard unless you've at least played 1.3 and watched the dozens of YouTube videos of AI parties duking it out in player run tournaments. I'm not saying you have to, but give it a shot, you might find it fun, and it's a small but passionate subculture of the community, if you're into that sort of thing anyway. Regardless, Grog Heights is a chill and easy battle, and it ends rather quickly. After the battle, however, we are treated to a scene where Ramza meets up with Orin once again, the absurdly OP astrologer from a while back. He's mounted on a chocobo, and Ramza discerns the black line on his armor and acknowledges that he is of the southern sky, of Gultana. Orin is surprised a Beowulf would help their side, but also admits that the reason they hunt the deserters is not out of enmity, but duty. Ramza asks if he recognized him in their last meeting, and Orin says yes, he saw the bill from the church and his face on it. He laughs and wonders what possible thing Ramza could have done to attain the church's ire, so 
Ramza asks Oren if he is to turn him in then, but Oren has no interest in heretics and he does not wish to harm Ramza. Ramza asks why he still fights then. Oren says, so long as swords are drawn, he and his people must fight. It's as simple as that. They are duty and honor bound. Ramza then feels safe enough to request a message to be brought to Count Orlandu, Thunder God Sid that is, and there are unseen hands that goad either side to further war and that his father, the late king, once trusted Sid with his life and was the only man he could call a true friend. Oren tells us that he is the adopted son of the Count and that he promises to pass on th this message. So that's why he's absurdly OP, like father like son apparently. Ramza guesses correctly that Oren and thus Sid know of the High Confessor's plot, but Oren says they have no hard evidence and so action is stalled. Ramza may have that evidence on him, the heretical Germanic scriptures, but smartly does not divulge that to Oren and instead says he simply wishes to know if they would lay down their arms if such evidence existed. Oren is pressed to continue their march by his soldiers and so Oren gives us one last piece of advice. Ramza does have friends and those friends would fight for his cause if need be, including himself. Ramza thanks him and we continue our journey onto Riovain Castle. Our next battle is at the walled city of Yardro, a 10 century old city surrounded by thick stone walls. Here we see the same mysterious man who tasked us to head to Riovain Castle arguing with a young woman, both clad in white. Merrick, the man, and the one he argues with, the woman called Rafa, seem to be on opposite sides. Rafa apparently wishes to leave the employ of their caretaker, whom uses both of them as assassins, and begs with Merrick to leave with her. To further complicate things, their caretaker is also their adoptive father. Quite a lot of adoption going on in the lands of Ivalice, it seems. And so to suggest abandonment is to suggest sedition. Duke Barrington had opened his heart and home to them, and to repay him as such is folly. Rafa tries to snap Merrick out of it and reminds him that the Duke is the one that set fire to their village in the first place, making them orphans. And the only reason Duke Barrington did that and adopted the two siblings was so he could use them and their unusual magical abilities to further his own ends. Merrick slaps Rafa and denies her ill-mannered tongue. He's in too deep and the shock of the truth has yet to raise him from his stupor. So he takes his frustrations out on his sister. I wonder where he learned that behavior, huh? Then Rafa mentions the thing that the Duke did to her, but Merrick can't listen to it and refuses to believe it. Just then a ninja appears and gives word to Merrick that Rams's party draws near. As our party enters the scene, Rafa runs to us and begs for aid, and so we accept and must protect Rafa from the wrath of Merrick and his ninja and summoners. Rafa and Merrick are unique in their jobs, Hell Knight and Heaven Knight as they were called in the PlayStation version, but as mages with unusual power, so are their magics unusual. Not only do they possess the only alternate elemental magics in the game, earth element, water element, wind element, etc., the way the siblings employ this magic is through RNG. Like axes and bags, their magics have a range of damage that can happen. The magic targets random tile spaces within its spell field and with a random number of hits, up to a maximum of 10. So theoretically, you could have up to 10 999 damage hits in one turn, making them the most powerful units by a long country mile. But that happens about as often as winning the lottery on your birthday, so these two siblings tend to be on the weaker end of the power scale in this game. Because instead of 10 uber hits at once, you could literally completely miss the enemy unit and cast the spell only once. Ouch. Still, if you like frustration and slot machines, you'll love the Sky Seer and Nether Seer jobs. Still, even with their unusual magic, I beat Merrick down and his little ninja buddies and win the fight. Behind the walls of Yardro, Rafa tells us about Duke Barrington and about Riavain Castle. The Duke has eyes for the throne and even goes as far as to call himself King of the Forge, as he continues to amass arms and soldiers within his walls. But Ramza tells Rafa that the Duke does so because he is part of an order that would depose Larg and Goltana for their own ends and install the Duke as regent. Rafa asks why Ramza fights and he once again says it is because his name says he must for he is a Beowulf, but Ramza sees past that and says it is because Ramza sees injustice and evil and he is compelled to act. It is in his nature. Ramza asks about what about Rafa and she tells him their story. Ramza remarks that the Duke was a great man who erected many orphanages throughout Ivalice, but it was of course for ulterior motives. He wished to groom these children into assassins for his own gain. Rafa admits that their people, the Galthinas, were keepers of their sacred art, their unusual magics, passed down through generations, and that her brother and her were conduits 
of the heaven and of the nether, and they channeled such power by mantra. Duke Barrington wanted that power too, and when their village elder refused to acquiesce, the duke burned their village down, killing everyone there. He's an all or nothing, scorched earth kind of guy. Rafa had recently learned of the duke's obfuscation and misdeeds and that he even went as far as to sexually accost Rafa because everything is a toy to be used in the duke's eyes, even his own adoptive children. Even though Ramza meant it in regards to the younger orphans, he says it is unfortunate that such a man of his station would prey upon the weak, looking directly at Rafa even though Rafa and Merrick are some of the most powerful mages ever and hold a secret form of magic that is replicated by none other in all of Ivalice. Ramza still is awkwardly blunt and insensitive in his philosophical musings. Look, he's not the best at the social game, but he tries, okay? Then a remote controlled talking frog enters the scene. Boy, we really are in a Final Fantasy game after all, and tells Ramza and Rafa to head to Riovane Castle if Ramza ever wishes to see Alma again. Oh, and then the frog blows up. Anyway, we get a bonus fight after that with Princess Ovilia and Delita back in Zeltenia Castle Chapel Ruins. Princess Ovilia prays by herself and Delita comes by to collect her before nightfall, but then intercepts a shuriken meant for Ovilia. Two ninjas appear under the orders of Duke Larg and we must kill them to save the princess. Again, while I appreciate the fact that I get to play as Delita, there are only two enemy units and I one-shot either of them easily, so it's effectively an interactive cutscene. Still, the whole point of the scene is to reaffirm that Delita may play the part for Coltana or whomever else, but he is still being honest and truthful with Ovilia and really does wish to protect her and what she stands for. I think there's a reason why Delita is a golden knight and not a traditional white knight. The ambition colors him too much. He may believe what he says, but his actions are often at odds with his words or intentions. Still, words are meaningless without action, so really, is anything ever pure? Is anything ever wholly absolved of personal ambition or gain? One does good not only because it is such and because people are grateful, but because it makes one feel good too. Regardless of reason, goodness is colored by the ambition or wants of the self in every instance. I suppose the game is asking if that's enough of a reason to use someone or something, or must it be all or nothing? Can even such a thing exist in the first place? We shall find out. At the next node, the next map, we must cross through the haunted Yugwood to reach Riovane Castle. After some quick tavern missions and outfitting our units, we enter the Yugwood and must do battle with various ghosts and undead units. These ghosts are actually spirits of those that fell in the battle of the 50 years war and they are indeed ornery. This battle is genuinely a tough one if you don't go for the petrify or seal evil tactic and even if you do because the map is on the smaller side, the ghosts and other powerful undead human units will bunker your party pretty easily and you will not have a fun time. In fact, I had to restart the battle because I didn't respect the threat of teleporting ghosts and their ability to long range throw their... Uh, <clears throat> ectoplasm from basically anywhere and pump out damage at a rapid pace. Regardless, I eventually whittle the ghostly threat down to nothing and break through the undead warriors of the 50 years war and finally move on to another three part battle and to the end of chapter three. And whew, are these three battles quite the doozy, let me tell you. When I was a kid growing up in the 90s, I lived in a town called Walnut Creek. And in this then small town, there was a wonderful deli called Genova Delicatessen, which was right next door to another wonderful Italian pizza joint called Sorrento's, and both are still there as far as I know. And during the summers, I would ride my bike from my house, which was about a mile away, and I would purchase one of the best sourdough roast beef sandwiches that I still think about to this day. And as I ate my summer lunch, I would read one of the many Prima or Brady official game guides to whatever game I might have rented that weekend or was lucky enough that my mom had bought me and I would study that book like it was for the SATs and I was trying to get into an Ivy League school. And for one summer, I was playing, would you know it, Final Fantasy Tactics for the first time. Now, I did not own the guide to Final Fantasy Tactics when I first played and as I eventually got to the last three missions of Chapter 3, as you might have guessed, I came up against a wall. I realized that no matter what, I just could not beat one certain fight. I mean, I tried everything I could think of, every trick I had at my disposal, but it just simply was not enough. So I begged my mom to go to the mall one weekend and we went into Babbage's and I scoured the shelves and I found the guidebook I was looking for. Surely here my answers would be found. My mother reluctantly agreed to purchase it, thankfully, and so the next day my little legs pedaled harder than they ever pedaled before and I ordered another delicious sourdough roast beef sandwich 
and sat outside in Geneva's wire frame tables and chairs, and I read that prima tome in search for answers. Eventually, I found the battle described in the book. I found out what I needed to do. <laughs> and it was in this moment that my heart sank, and the delicious roast beef in my mouth turned to ashes. Even the soothsayers and seers of Prima guidebooks had no out for me. There was nothing I could do. There was no hell coming. There was no cavalry on the hill. I understood in that moment that I was, for lack of a better term, boned. Royally even. I sat back in the wire mesh chair, and I remember this distinctly, and I listened to the birds chirp above me and their maple trees, the cars putter by on Treat Boulevard, the few adult patrons in their ties and pantsuits shuffling back to work, brown bags in hand, and I felt a deep sadness, or more accurately, it was lassitude, a broad and defining emptiness of energy that washed over me. Time is a wonky concept, especially to the young, and even though it was only about 25 hours worth of work, a long weekend of gaming to me now, it was in reality weeks of playing, weeks of thinking about it at school or football practice or on the toilet. It was the first time I understood the concept of reward versus outcome. Despite the cheery song of cardinals above my head, I knew despair was soon to follow. I knew the only option was the nuclear kind. I would have to restart the game over entirely. Crying or arguing or denying. I had to. It was as simple as that. I didn't even finish my delicious sourdough roast beef sandwich. I left everything on the wire mesh table and listlessly pedaled back home. I knew it had to be done, and so I did it. Before the brutal three-part battle of Riovane Castle proper, we view a cutscene with Duke Barrington, Lord Fulmarv, and Wegref. The Duke mentions that a castle is never as pretty as when it is dressed for war, and wouldn't it be nice if the seat of the crown knew such beauty too? Lord Falmarv wonders what he was called for, and the Duke says it was because their party holds the true power, not Gultana or Larg, but the ones with the Zodiac Stones, and the Duke would want that power. Falmarv attempts to misdirect the Duke's understanding, but the Duke does not bite. The Duke wonders why they pursue Ramza, but Falmarv says his company, the Knights Templar, do not share orders with the Inquisitors of the Church, and so know nothing about it. The Duke denies such obfuscation, however, and orders Merrick into the room where Isolut, the son of Lord Falmarv, has been captured, and thus told the Duke of their plans. Falmarv does not take to Isolut's capture well, so Duke Barrington extorts an alliance, a mutually beneficial accord between the Knights Templar and his forces, or he would expose the church for their plots. Even Gotana and Larg may band together under such seditious activities, so it would be best to see the church remain clandestine. However, Fulmarv orders Wegraf to catch up to Merrick and says that he will deal with Duke Barrington personally. It seems Fulmarv is unfazed by such threats, threats of mere humans, that is. Thunder cracks outside, and Lord Fulmarv reverses the threat onto Duke Barrington instead. The Duke's knights surround Falmarv and Isolude, but they know not of what it, horror is about to transpire. A golden light hues between Falmarv's tabard and the zodiac stone he holds beckons to power. Okay, so the first battle is at Riovane Castle Gate. This isn't too hard, but yet again, the archers at the top of the ramparts will make mincemeat of your units. So, I'd suggest using Archer's Bane reaction ability, or the Reflex's reaction ability, which will eliminate arrow attacks completely or give a very high chance at evading them, respectively. Merrick joins the archers at the top of the castle gates, and he and Rafa share words. Rafa begs Merrick to come to his senses and leave the Duke, but he refuses again, saying that Turncloaks would never find quarter and would be pursued relentlessly. He says the Duke granted them one last mission to destroy Ramza and recover the Germanic scriptures, and then he would set them free. But Rafa isn't as naive and attempts to say as much. In any case, once we damage Merrick or Rafa enough, they both teleport in way, and we have to clean up the other units to end the fight and progress. The one hidden floating knight in the waterway of the castle has geomancy and, as he did to me, can basically end the fight immediately by turning one of your units, in my case Ramza, into a frog. Frog status in the game basically makes you insanely weak and all you can do is lick things to death, so it's more or less a death sentence. The knights hit hard, Merrick hits hard, and of course the archers hit hard, so large HP pools or correct defensive reaction abilities are required here if you don't want to have a bad time. The map is big too, so don't feel bad about a strategic retreat, let the enemy come to you, a classic strategy in most tactics games by the way. 
Dancers are particularly effective in large maps with units that can't move too well, so keep that in mind as well. Still, persist and keep your units alive enough and you will win the battle as I did. Back in Riovane dungeon, Alma waits. Hearing a commotion outside, Alma wonders what's going on. Soon, a bloodied and battered knight bursts through her cell door. He warns of a hell beast on the loose and tells Lady Alma to save herself. Not one to lightly take an opportunity, Alma watches the brave knight die and then she flees from her dungeon cell. And here it is, the fight that ended a thousand save files. In Riovane Castle Keep, Ramza remarks on the ghoulish violence surrounding him, the blood and death that permeates. Something dark has happened here, something wicked. Wegraf stands atop the stone steps of the keep, around the countless dead knights he has slain, and orders Ramza to draw his blade. Ramza pities Wegraf, however, invoking his sister's name, wondering what she would think of him now. But the proud Wegraf we once knew is gone. Only the possessed man of dark ambition and anguish remain. The Lukavi flickering within his embers requires kindling, and Wegraf will sate such a demand. Technically, this is a two-part battle, or two-phase battle, as we first must push through the human Wegraf. And boy, if you are not prepared for this, and only use one save slot, like I did back in the day, this is the moment you have just bricked your game and must start over. Sorry, but that's life sometimes. Wegraf hits hard, and he hits fast. His lightning blade may one-shot you if you are a mage of some kind or don't have up-to-date gear, so you literally might not even be able to issue one command before the battle is over. That being said, there are quite a few different strategies you can employ going into the first half of this fight. One good tactic is to use the chemist's reaction ability, Auto Potion, which will use the lowest rank of potion you have after taking any damage, so if you only have X potions in your inventory, Ramza will immediately heal for 150 HP after Wegraf attacks, which is about the same amount of damage Wegraf will deal per Lightning Strike, or Hallowed Bolt in the PSP version. Considering most units, including Ramza, have on average around 200 to 300 HP by this point in the game, you only realistically have one turn to hurt him enough that it forces the transition into Phase 2. This is the delicate little dance that happens here. How do you pump out fat quantities of damage in one turn and still survive at least two turns of damage from Wegraf? You could do what I did, which was use the Black Mage's Flare Magic in conjunction with gear that boosts magic power output and essentially one-shot Wegraf, or you could opt for the tried-and-true dual-wield Night Sword strategy. Though keep in mind, Wegraf has counter-equipped, so he will counter any physical attacks with one of his own, thus chewing into your precious HP pool even more. In any case, once you damage Wegraf enough, he will teleport back to the top of the stairs and says, this has gone on long enough. In this moment, Wegraf will transform back into Belias, but with a little help this time. Belias summons a few demons to fight by his side, and oh boy times three are these little demon boys quite the annoying cunts. Each demon can use powerful dark magics, like Dark Holy, which have incredible range and can hit multiple units at once, and do very good magic damage. So for phase two, if you can, having units with low faith will severely limit the damage output of these demons. High bravery and low faith units are quite the boon in phase two, so it's a good strategy to use if you can. Because you start phase two with most of your units bunched together on the lower end of the stairs, it is quite easy for Belias or the demons to immediately take out a couple, if not all, of your units and thus leave you severely diminished, which will most likely result in a fail state. Speaking of, I failed this fight, as you will when fighting the Lukavi, many times and had to restart at least four or five times. RNG is RNG after all, and we all must bend to the whims of chance. Belias will often use his summon magics and the second most powerful summon in the game, Cyclops. Not only will he cast this on most of your units, no matter where you move them, but he will do it quickly and often. Cyclops hits hard, man, so having a good counter or defense to magic is key here. Low faith or auto potion or heavy white magics are advised. To be honest, the best strategy here is to, again, full press into Belias and not worry about the demons. Let them take their unholy pot shots. You need to dish out damage and you need to do it fast and hard. The fight should end in two or three turns, otherwise you will most likely fail and Belias will wipe his ass with you. So for my winning team comp this time, I went with a ninja, a samurai, a black mage Ramza, and another black mage clubber, and a geomancer equipped with a slot machine axe, cause you know, why not? We were all about level 35 on average, the enemies being around level 29, so it was more or less a fair fight. Again, when fighting the Lukavi, don't worry about units dying, just keep pressing the damage and eventually Belias will fall and die and turn into Azure Dust.
Congrats, you have just beaten one of the hardest fights in the game. Cookies and cakes are in the break room when you're ready. Let's pour one out for old Weegraf. Back in Riovane Castle proper, where Duke Barrington tried to extort Fulmarv, Alma enters the room and sees the carnage the Lukavi have wrought. Everyone is dead save one man, Isolute. Isolute sputters blood and asks for his sword. His knightly duty compels him still to fight, but he cannot see, and asks for a candle to light his way. Alma attempts to comfort the dying man, but he recognizes her voice and tells her to inform Ramza about the evil of the Orsite. Ramza was right, he says and everyone must band together to defeat the greater threat. Alma says that Ramza has defeated the demon, but he thinks she means his father Fulmar. At peace, Isolute thanks her and tells her to receive the Orosite within his doublet and keep it safe. His watch has ended, and with that, he shuts his eyes for the last time. And as if sensing his son's death, Fulmar enters the room in that exact moment and attempts to away with Alma. But just as he touches Alma, Fulmar's Orosite shines and murmurs. He thought he would never find their quarry so soon, mayhaps even a century from now, but here she is, right in front of him. What luck. Alma demands to be set free, but Fulmarv speaks truly when he says she has nothing to fear and that her life is safe. He knocks her unconscious and drapes her over his shoulder, the ultimate prize in tow. So remember a couple hours ago when I first mentioned the god-awful AI for the guest characters and the other countless times I reiterated that point again? Well, here's one of the worst culprits in the game in regards to guest AI. I genuinely raged quit over this back in the day, and to my surprise this time around, I did it again. On the roof of Riovane Castle, Duke Barrington has seemingly escaped the demonic onslaught inside his keep and has cornered Rafa. He harangues her about his virtuous gift of adoption, about the life she was allowed to lead, calling her a wretch to betray him so. However, Rafa does not care and has come for vengeance of her family and village. As Rafa brandishes her blade, Duke Barrington scoffs and draws his own gun on her rebuking her silly claim of vengeance. He is too big to fail and she is too small to win, and not to mention he is her father. Rafa cannot do the deed, however, and Barrington thinks he knows why. The flesh remembers such trembling and fear when she was young, and he says in that time when the fear blossoms into a different kind of flower, he will take that from her as well. Quite the delusional and psychotic romantic, that one. Just then Merrick enters the scene and asks the Duke if it's all true. Finally, it seems the veil of ignorance has been lifted and Merrick sees with eyes unfettered. In a rage and seeing her brother at her side, Rafa has steeled herself and says she will kill the Duke, but Merrick senses the Duke's itchy trigger finger and jumps in front of the bullet meant for Rafa. Still in grief, as Rafa thinks Merrick dead, she asks her father why he did it, because regardless of their traumatic childhood and the truth of the Duke's wanton murder, he is still their father after all. These three are family whether they want it or not. The Duke orders Rafa to collect the Orsite Merrick has and give it to him. <laughs> but in a darkly humorous twist of fate, Duke Barrington is anticlimactically thrown from the roof by an unknown woman assailant. A sultry, calm man's voice instead tells Rafa to give the Orsite to him. It appears Marquis Elmdor de Limberry yet lives. Ramza orders Rafa to run away. He knows the Marquis and the lady that tossed the Duke are not human. They have answered the call of the Lukavi as well. The Marquis, being a gentleman of sorts, does not wish to kill Ramza if he would relinquish the stone in his care. He may even convince Fulmarv to return Alma, but Ramza knows too well these are the dark lies of the Lukavi. Impatiently, the Marquis orders his femme fatales, Celia and Letty, to take the stone by force, and so begins one of the worst battles in the game. First off, like all fights with the Marquis, he has some great gear to steal, if you can reach him that is. His assassin comrades have some utterly disgusting skills at their disposal, mainly Shadow Stitch and Stop Bracelet, which guarantees stop and death, respectively. These are bullshit and entirely OP, and I hate them with every ounce of my being. I'm not bitter in the slightest, I swear. In order to steal Emdor's Muramasa Katana, a very rare katana in the game, you must be able to reach him first. And because you start on the lower precipice of the roof, whichever unit needed to steal will have to have enough jump stat, or be able to ignore height from the Lancer job, and have at least seven move in order to get even close to the Marquis, and this has to happen before Celia and Letty destroy you and before Rafa dies. And there's the rub. Rafa's craptacular AI will sometimes run straight into the Marquis and assassins and die immediately. Like literally before you can even start the battle, the battle will end. The AI will spit in your eye, take your girl, and drive off into the sunset while throwing fistfuls of money in the air. Even typing this now, saying this now, thinking about it much later after it happened, I feel my blood curdle a little bit. Jesus Christ, I hate this fight. And when the robot revolution happens and AI becomes sentient, I will be on the front lines, knife between teeth, screaming about Rafa and Celia and Elmdor. 
Did, did I mention I very much dislike this battle? Well, because I do. Still, if you don't care about stealing Elmdor's rare equipment, then the best goal is to damage him enough as fast as you can, or Rafa will get herself killed and you'll lose the battle. Just pray to the RNG gods that the game allows you to do so, and eventually you will damage the Marquis enough that he retreats and the battle ends. I cannot stress enough how much I fucking hate this fight. Oh, I, I forgot, to add insult to injury, Elmdor has one of the strongest reaction abilities in the game, Hamido or first strike, which allows him to counter attack first and then delete your attack from ever occurring. Do I really have to say it again or do y'all get it yet? I don't like this map at all. Okay, not not one bit. Usa. Once we kill Elmdor, he'll tell us to chase him to Limberry Castle for the rest of the Orosite. Now we have our next destination. As the dawn breaks upon Riovane Castle, Rafa comforts the dying Merrick. She cries over her brother's body, and in that moment, the orosite she holds reacts and stirs. It seems to resonate with the grief of Rafa. Ramza remarks how it was the same with Wegraf, and that it summoned forth the Lukavi in the first place. Rafa agrees to the whispers of the stone, and Ramza attempts to say no, but it is too late. The stone hovers and glistens, and then beams of light radiate down into Merrick and revive him. In a strange turn of fate, the stone of demonic power and darkness blesses Merrick with life and nothing more, no strings attached. A pure moment of grief is rewarded with compassion and grace. Back in the room with Eastlood, Ramza finds the indigo ore site he once held. Merrick explains what happened to him in a voiceover, or text over as it were, and says a voice called out to him in a land of pure white. Return, it said to him, return to the side of the valiant, to the hearts that beat true. Ramza thought the stones were purely demonic in nature, but Merrick states that the intent of the stone bearers seems to give such power shape. Ramza steals his resolve and promises to rescue his sister Alma. The civil war has reached a stalemate, and both sides are beset with loss and fatigue. In a last-ditch effort to turn the tide of war, Lark and his northern sky march upon Fort Besselet, the bulwark to the south. We can now have Rafa and Merrick formally join our ranks. Merrick tells Ramza that they most probably took Alma to Milan, the high seat of the church's power. Ramza suspects not even the High Confessor knows the stone's powers, only that a select few do. The High Confessor might only want the stone for their perceived symbolic power, and knows nothing of the actual magics within them. Someone is using the church and the High Confessor for their own means. These whispers of Lukavi of the stones seem to have originated elsewhere. There is more to the plot than only lust for power. This closes out chapter 3 in the first half of the game, and the first half of this playthrough slash retrospective video. There is still much to come and much to do, even though chapter 4 is the last chapter of the game, it's almost equal in length to the first three in story and gameplay. So there's at least another two hours of video coming in some weeks that will detail the story and the end game activities. I hope you've been entertained thus far as you're at work or on a second monitor playing some games or what have you, and I look forward to seeing you back in the final part of this video. Thank you for watching if you've watched this far, and go play the game right now if you have it. Deal? All right. Uh, thank you again, and see you next time. This is the part of the game in which we dance, uh, I mean go do side quests. First order is to go to the volcano map and have someone with move find to get to the top of the volcano and find the materia blade, the only weapon that allows Cloud to use his limit break special job ability. Nothing special to note here, just reset the map and load a previous save if you fail to acquire it the first time. Now the next side quest we go on is to acquire three special characters, that's Beowulf, Reese, and Construct 8. Oh, and Balthier too, and Cloud, so I guess five characters and not three. Math is hard sometimes. Anyway, Beowulf is essentially a status effect version of a White Knight or Holy Knight, so instead of having powerful damage dealing abilities, Beowulf can do all the status spells, but instantly and with great range. Reese is a dragon turned lady turned dragon turned back into a lady, and the wife lover of Beowulf. Reese is a fun character to mess around with, and finally we get access to Construct 8, an automaton with some seriously powerful physical magic. They all self damage Construct 8, but have enormous range and or stopping power. He also has no faith, so is immune to all status effects besides Confuse for whatever reason, and is only allergic to lightning based skills. He's a de facto tank and allows players to use him as a literal stepping stone to get to higher places. 
He's surprisingly versatile for being so singular in design. So for a long five to eight hours, you'll go through the side quests and collect your bonus characters, and eventually we'll move on to the main quest back at Dagura Pass, a sort of holy mountaintop for the monks of old, now lining the defenses of Bervenia and Limberry. The side quests associated with Beowulf and Reese factor in somewhat to the plot, but are basically just a little world building mini story arc that don't propel the main narrative in any tangible way. So I'm electing to mostly go over the plot in a few sentences. And it goes like this. Reese and Beowulf were engaged and loved each other. Another dude named Bremont caught an eye for Reese and wanted her to himself. So he prepped a curse for Beowulf, but Reese took the bullet instead in a very, you know, anime-esque moment of self-sacrifice. Reese turned into a dragon and wandered around the world very confused, apparently, as one would be, I suppose. So Beowulf hunts down Bremont and eventually kills him and then reverses the curse. And that's it. That's the story. Not bad, but ultimately not really relevant to the main narrative. Still, we get three very cool and powerful characters to have fun with. How However, for my party build, I will only be using non-unique characters, so this matters little to me in this playthrough. At Dagura Pass, we are met with a small contingent of soldiers and black mages and archers and dragoons and a rather vertical map, meaning of course that archers and mages and dragoons will benefit greatly from this layout and will, as usual, be an annoyance to deal with, like mayflies on a sweltering day. Still, just press into them and they will die quickly. Not much to say here, simply another battle on the way to Limberry. The next battle up is Free City Bervenia, birthplace of Saint Ajora apparently, and it is consequently under the yoke of the church. This is another vertical heavy battle, and as we enter the field, we find a green-robed woman on top of some stone buildings. She denies us entry and reveals herself to be or Meladiol, or Meladowl, Tangiel, a sister of her slain brother, Isolude. Ooh, right, 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 that guy. Uh, Meli is here on her own accord, as she states, in no compliance with the church. She is here for vengeance. Melodials, or Melodols, or whatever the fuck I'm gonna call her, Meli, is a divine knight which has the abilities that destroy equipment at range along with a very heavy reduction in HP. So, if you value your potentially rare equipment from some of these side quests you've been doing, I'd recommend not using those items or having the chemist's safeguard reaction ability which prevents theft and breakage of a character's equipment. Otherwise, you will be reloading a save file consistently. Still, even with her potential OP and tear-inducing Divine Knight skills, Melly dies to a single flare cast by our boy, our true blue corn-fed Kansas good old boy, black mage of a main protagonist, that's Ramza. Perhaps hilariously, Melly admits that we fight well, and it's no small wonder that we graph fell to us. Cue the eight times I save state scum and the random dumb luck that forced a win. But yes, Melly, it was superior tactics that won the day. Melly does the classical villain goodbye and says next time rabbit slash gadget next time and then teleports away and the battle ends. Then we cut to Delita at Zeltania Castle. Delita somberly gazes at a pendant in his hand and reminisces about his sister Tietra. Because of this, he seeks out Princess Ovelia, whom is outside the keep, practicing her grass whistles. Delita asks where she learned that trick and Ovelia says she learned it from a friend at the monastery. She laments she could never figure out the correct way to make the whistle and so Delita attempts to show her the correct way. The grass whistle being a clear metaphor for the will to power and for the politics of the crown and war at hand. Ovelia is elated that for once she grasps the concept and produces a whistle from the blade of grass. Ovelia wonders the price for this knowledge for this experience in war and lineage as it were and Delita explains that he keeps his sister's pendant as a reminder of her, a reminder of that price. She died as a pawn, as a tool of service for greater hands unseen. Ovelia, still naive to what's happening, simply says she is sorry for Delita's loss. A kind thought, albeit wholly missing the point. Delita plays the hero, however, and swears that he will not let the same happen to Ovelia. Even though we, the audience, know that is a promise that must be broken somewhat, that cannot be any other way than somewhat broken. To make the world whole, one must bind that which is otherwise separate, the crown and the civil conflict. The idea of what Ovelia is and the reality of what she wants will have no other choice than to merge and be made as one again. Many people may consider this binding, this, this repair, as noble or heroic, while others may see it as inevitable and unavoidable and ultimately without repudiation. Either way, choice will have no say in the end. Next battle is at Finneth Creek, and this is the battle in which you will start hating those multicolored chicken horses of the Final Fantasy mythos. Not only do chocobos have ridiculous movement range, but the red and black ones have some of the most powerful physical magics in the game that require no MP or cast time, 
by the way, especially the Red Chocobo's Choco Meteor, and some of you Final Fantasy XIV players will know the pain of such an ability, as indeed the fate in the game was based on the absurd power of the Final Fantasy Tactics variant. There's nothing special about this map per se, just kill all the chickens as fast as possible before they kill you, and they will kill you. No joke, that Choco Meteor is straight busted. After Finneth Creek, Zeltania Castle, home of Duke Coltana, where we are greeted with the cutscene, or rather another FMV. A heretic at prayer in a church, passing bold, Ramza. I shall ask it plain. Why has the High Confessor planted you amongst Goltana's men? I see no harm in telling you. Duke Goltana and Count Orlando. I am to assassinate them. <gasps> Groups such as the Corpse Brigade, ill-contented with the Crown and the nobility are in no short supply. The Church only fans Rebellion's flame. The people tire of war and their disdain for the crown waxes with each passing day. Of course, Goltana and Lark want to put down the rebellions at home, only they lack the troops to do so. To break the impasse, they seek to bring an end to the conflict for good and all. Even as we speak, their armies mess at Fort Bessala to that purpose. Then these months of rebellion and unrest, it all goes as the High Confessor had planned. Yes, but it will not end as they have hoped. Larg and Goltana will be assassinated once the battle begins. Cut off one head, and two more spring forth. So naturally their closest allies must die with them. Count Orlando of the Order of the Southern Sky, Zalbag of the Northern, and of course, Lord Dysodark. With their leaders gone, the fighting will cease, and they will have no choice but to embrace the peace we offer. A peace? Or surrender on the Church's terms? The people will proffer to the Church the role of mediator with hands upraised. What's more? The Church will have the Zodiac Braves. But there's the rub. One thing yet remains between the Church and the Aurasite. The heretic, Ramza Beulf. Is that it? You've come to fetch the Aurasite for your masters? I am no hound healing at the Church's skirts. I answer to no one but myself. Save her life. I would gladly give my own. You must think this strange. No. I understand only too well. I address the heretic Ramza Bayo. You are besieged. You 
will surrender yourself up to us at once. I know that voice. Confessor Salmore. <laughs> And so all is laid bare. The church wishes to seize the opportunity for control by goading either side to war and collect the scraps of power at the end of the fighting. Rebellions amass all throughout Italy because of waning supplies, famine, low morale, all that stuff. And so both lines must contend with each other and now the masses, creating an instability of power regardless of which line wins. The church shepherds this coming power vacuum from the shadows, and Delita understands this while he goes along with the church for now. He states he is no one's puppet that he is no one's vassal. His ambition is burnished and clean and apparent to make a better world from what he grew up in, to construct a better world either of the lions or holy shepherds will to make. Ramza asks Delita bluntly about his own ambitions, about how he must use Ovilia just as the lions or the church would, and Delita is not wholly sure yet what he would do, but does admit he would give his life for Ovilia. However, as we come to understand Delita, what he really means is that he would trade or would have traded his life for his sisters, not necessarily Ovilia's. Delita simply cannot accept this truth quite yet, and so must continue playing the dutiful, idealist, somewhat anti-hero for now. And so the next battle is against High Confessor Zalmor again, uh, and at least this time for the last time. The old holy man is about to meet his demise. Luckily, we get Delita as a guest character, so not only am I super overpowered for this fight with my own party, but Delita is a one-man army unto himself. This fight being a trouncing is an understatement. While the map is another vertical mage fest, because of Delita's Holy Knight abilities, it really doesn't matter and most enemies will be crushed in no time. Zalmor attempts to persuade us to give up and die peacefully, as is the want of most dogmatic organizations in a medieval setting, but Delita rightfully calls out his sanctimonious bullshit and says that all the church wants in perpetuity for all people in Ivalice to be under the yoke of a big daddy gods and the people who say they interpret those gods will until everything else. Even Ramza can see this for Christ's sakes. The most doe-eyed, milk-toast, naive good boy can recognize the fallacy of the church and the crown's control. But Zalmor's only retort is the classical strong-arm, strong-man appeal to power. You ran, therefore you guilty. <laughs> and honestly, I feel like this is the church's stance on all people of Ivalice. You all ran, you were all sheep and in need of shepherding. Therefore, you were all guilty in need of guidance. Not much difference to the politics of the crown, but I suppose that's the point of this whole damn story, isn't it? After the battle, we tell Delita of our plans to meet with Thunder God Sid and elicit aid to topple the church and their schemes. Oren suggested we reveal the scriptures of Germanique to his father as proof and Delita wishes us luck. Delita's ward, Val Mafra, from his splinter church group, the Black Rim Knights, provides him with an alternative task. And so once again, once best friends must depart from one another and go their separate ways. However, Belmafra readily eyes the conceit of Delita's actions as the two part and says even Ramza is just a tool to be used for Delita's ambitions, of which Delita does not take too kindly to such venomed words. Like I said, he still can't quite admit to himself that he is no different in function as those he rebels against. Our next stop on our journey to Limberry Castle is the Beta Sand Wastes, a poisonous sand pit from hell covering most of western Limberry. We are met with a Knight Templar, who wields a magical gun no less, discussing the logistics of something airborne to his men. As our party approaches, we exchange words with him, and he decides to let us in on his plans. A classical mistake. Hasn't this guy ever seen a James Bond movie? In any case, he tosses a bomb at our feet and it explodes, poisoning the entire squad at once. On a side note, much like Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, I really do enjoy the idea of map implicits or kiss curse effects that are enabled for each fight. For example, both players and enemies are poisoned at the beginning of this fight, but all healing effects are increased by 20% or by some flat amount. Or maybe everyone starts at low HP, but everyone also starts with regen or periodically certain unknown tiles in power or depower whomever step on them in addition to the plain old trap mechanics that already exist. Modifiers like this increase replayability and challenge for us veterans of tactics like combat anyway. A, a bit of a digression, yeah, but just thought I'd spit out the idea because of how this particular fight begins. Anyway, the knight reveals that it won't kill the knights who breathe 
this toxin in, but will reduce their capacity to fight. Ramza doesn't get the ploy why the church would poison their own men, but the knight simply states that it's a way to force conflict between either lion, either side of the faction of the civil war, and so the church will clean up the mess and assume control. The church means to fell Goltana and Lard and every head of state all at once. A decent stratagem, but ultimately a vapid one, as I am the main protagonist. And this isn't the last battle in the game, so I think we all know how this will end. With that, the game tells us to kill the knight, now so named as Beric, and so battle we must. This is a tough battle no matter how you slice it. Beric has insane range with his powerful magic gun, and as usual, so do the enemy archers. Basically, all the enemies have great range and nearly one-shot capability, so caution and perhaps low faith or low bravery units is advised. Chemists are good here, fast casting white mages too. Uh, regardless of your setup, this is a tough battle, and if you're like me, you'll have to restart and rearrange units a few times to eke out a victory. After the battle ends, however, Beric teleports away. I swear to god, it seems all the baddies in this game have a secret hidden reaction ability called Deus Ex or something. <sighs> in any case, we then cut to a few reluctant knights trying to arrest Thunder God Sid in suspicions of sedition against Duke Goltana. Suspicions of sedition is a Badass metal name, by the way. Goltana himself appears and is rather disappointed with Sid's rebellious path, even if Sid denies such treason. Goltana thinks Sid a thrall of the church, scheming behind his back. Information gleaned from the High Confessor himself, apparently. How convenient. Sid suggests it's the other way around, but Goltana is steadfast in his idea of Sid being a turncloak. Goltana cannot fathom such defiance in an already murky and costly civil war, even if it makes no sense, he sees shadows in every corner. Thusly, Sid is arrested and sent to a cell in the castle. How Goltana could know such information gleaned from the High Confessor is curious, but as that question sinks in, the answer soon enters the room a gilded knight by the name of Delita. Since Sid is now out of the equation and has been stripped of his rank, power, and rule, there is only one person capable of leading Goltana's army into battle now, and that is Delita, the now christened Knight Devout. Quite the come up for the lowborn knight apprentice from so long ago. Delita has played the game well and has reaped the benefits. Now in charge of the second most powerful army in all of Ivalice, with the secretive backing of a cabalistic, demonic infused church, it's as if Delita laid down his hand with a broad smile and said, All in, baby. The dude is sitting pretty, that's for sure. From here, as players, we finally complete the last side quest of the game to get bulkier, and in this version of the game, we are actually treated to a full motion video at Dorter City Slums. A godless thief with designs upon the church vaults. Could it be he seeks the stones? The road to the Orosite is barred by Templar swords, but it is the same road that leads to Alma. I will walk whatever road I must to see you free. Even if it means walking headlong into a trap! He took the bait! I told you he would! We've caught the wrong man. This one's not the thief. But he's still a heretic! Mistakes were twofold, I'm afraid. You sprung your trap without looking to see if the game you hunted was the one you snared. And you sold me short. I'm no thief. I'm a sky pirate. It's him! Now that we've dispensed with the pleasantries, tell me where I'll find the Cache of Globados. The Cache of Globados? Two heretics instead of one. Rum luck, I say. We'll claim the bounty for them both. Oh, you'll have your reward for finding me. And don't think about running off without collecting. My shot is faster. Oh, my name's not Balthier. Uh, we get to fight again on the second map of the game, one of my personal favorites, of course. But this time, we get the guest character, Balthier, whom has a special job called Sky Pirate. His job allows him access to all of the Thief abilities, plus Mustadio's abilities, plus an insanely OP four-hit attack. In short, Mustadio will be benched permanently from now on, Unless you're going for a themed chemist slash thief party makeup, Balthier is simply a far more powerful and versatile version 
of that little ponytail lad. Balthier starts with some powerful equipment as well as a very powerful and rare gun that you can't get anywhere else. And this fight is super easy, but if you can, some of the enemies have some nice stuff to steal, so line your pockets as you see fit. Now you might ask, why is Balthier even in this game? And to that I say, did you really want Vaughn instead? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. Also, as some might not know, Balthier and Bosch were originally supposed to be the main characters in Final Fantasy XII, but Squaresoft got cold feet in allowing older people as protagonists, so reverted back to their tried and true 17-year-old androgynous trappings by adding Vaughn as the pseudo main character in Final Fantasy XII. Anyway, welcome to Sky Pirate to your party if you want, and let us continue on with the story to Fort Besselette. Now, here's a nice thing I wish the game had done more of, giving us a choice of how to approach a battle. Give us a bit of a potential replayability by allowing us players to choose which map to do. We have the choice to enter the front or the rear giggity. Either map is not too difficult, so pick whichever you want. I decided to go with the more vertical based map because magics and movement skills would be far more versatile here. Lancers or dragoons and archers abound everywhere, so proceed with some sort of caution because you can potentially get swarmed quickly, but even then, it's an easy map in all honesty. Rio Vein, this is not. I decided to just crystal all the units in JP farm a bit, but I am a bit of a sadist, I suppose, so your mileage may vary. After the victory, we cut to our dear brother Zalbag, attending to the wounds of Dystarg and his troops atop the ramparts of Besselat. It seems there has been a mass poisoning, the one Berenk mentioned, of course, extracted from moss fungus spores. Then we see Larg, retching and dying, poisoned as well. Dystarg inspects his liege lord and asks if he is all right. Larg thinks he may very well be, but Dystarg thinks Thinks that is rather unfortunate, and so catalyzes the unaliving process by gutting Larg with a knife. It is in this moment that Larg recognizes the ambition he thought he could contain spill out, like blood from a wound, as it were. No honor among thieves, it seems, as Dykstarg now has assumed power of the Northern Order, and potentially all of Vivalis. House Beowulf has ascended, and now Larg is their paragon. Zalbag, being the dutiful knight, however, can't come to terms with this quickly enough, but Dykstarg collapses from the poison air. He has no choice but to blame it on Gotana assassins, as Dykstarg instructed, and now is complicit in these potentially treacherous plots, whether he likes it or not. Next battle is at the Sluice Gate, a dam meant to assuage the rough, wet season that has belied the civil war and caused so much problems with supply lines and with food exports. I like this map because it actually gives us something to do besides just killing things. We have to stand on a certain tile with two different units in order to flip a switch and thus open the dam. And I kind of wish more maps had things to do like this, extra conditions perhaps to satisfy, to spice up the battles. But nonetheless, this fight is an easy one as well. So just smash and pass and open up the sluice gate and let the water flood. After the battle, Orin and Ramza rush into the cell of Thunder God Sid. In a rare moment of respite, Sid remarks how Ramza has grown since the last time he saw him trying to lift his sword at the age of four. Sid thanks Ramza for his quick aid and says he is much like his father, Barbaneth. Because none of us can stay in this castle for long and because Sid is more or less a heretic as well now, Thunder God Sid decides he will travel with us, with Ramza from now on. Sid entrusts his son Orin to go to the Zeltania castle to protect Ovilia. And now we have access to the most broken, most OP character in probably any Final Fantasy title, the man, the myth, the bloody legend, Thunder God, one man army Sid. This dude alone has every ability that the other various Holy Knight jobs have, in addition to having Excalibur, the second best or maybe even best knight sword in the entire game that provides auto haste. So not only can Sid one shot nearly everything, but he can do it twice as fast. Do yourself a favor and bench him. I, I, I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. And I say this because the game will simply become a cheese fest if you don't. Not that a full party of mathematicians don't do that already, but you get what I mean. In any case, we switch back to Goltana with his old man bluster, wondering who let the sluice gate open and flooded the battlefield. Delita jaunts into the room and kneels at the feet of his lord. Goltana orders him to pursue the beleaguered Northern Sky army, but Delita refuses. Goltana is taken aback at such impudence, but Delita reminds the dear daddy Duke that such negative Nancy histrionics is unbecoming of a liege lord, and so runs the old man through with his sword. No one wants a negative Nancy as their lord, Delita reminds us. Then Val and a man posing as Sid enter the room and Delita thanks the poser and his tribute he's about to impart. A true believer, the poser is then slain by Delita in a classic twisteroo by killing two birds with one stone as it were. The once fallen count, that's Sid, 
has slain the Duke and been slain in response, thereby setting up the dissolution of both the Northern and Southern sky. Two wolves tearing each other apart, as it were, unconcerned with a now guideless sheep. Perfect vacuum for, say, a church to fill. Or maybe even a certain gilded knight, huh? High Confessor Marcel, the leader of the Church of Glavidos, came forward to mediate a truce between the factions and consolidate power on either side of the church. But both leaders presumably have been lost. So the church has no other recourse but to take total control. <laughs> it's very convenient, yeah? Uh, from here, we can finish up the cloud quest lines and acquire Worker 8 as well. And, and while the fight with Worker 8 is genuinely annoying and actually difficult, I won't go over too much of it, but suffice to say, the birdies in this map like to petrify and one-shot, as well as Worker 8 having near infinite range and one-shot capabilities himself. So, you know, be prepared to restart this map a few times and change up some party abilities and whatnot. Oh, and there are some dragons to boot, so, you know, there's that. After Worker 8, we can head back to Gouge to pick up Cloud. The logic of this universe being that somehow the Zodiac Stones pulled Cloud from the life stream during his Nom flashback phase in that game. So he's a bit out of it and disoriented, but lucky for us, he still has his soldier mentality and kind of wants to kill monsters with us. You know, easy peasy. Cloud's job abilities are very cool and fun to use, but for whatever reason, you can only use them with the Materia Blade, a sort of mid-tier ranked sword. And if you notice, the sprite of a sword it looks vaguely familiar to Ultimate Weapon from Final Fantasy 7. So Cloud is sort of gimped in this game, but it's honestly not that big of an issue. Regardless, to fully complete his side quest, we head back to Salgidos and help that familiar flower girl kill some knaves and rogues along the way. Super easy map, nothing to write home about, although the map is very cool looking. Congrats, you now have all the side characters in the game. Not that we're gonna use them or anything, but hey, at least it's something. Uh, actually, for the next fight, we are staying in Trade City Salgidos. Some ninjas stop us and demand a toll. Yes, that was a real sentence, by the way. Lucky for us, we don't take kindly to extortion even by ninjas, so we gently deny their request and instead obliterate them from existence. Fair trade, I would say. This map is again beset by archers who start at the highest point, but honestly, out of all the archer-based maps in this game, this one really isn't too bad. Mostly because we are quite powerful by this point, replete with units of all kinds, especially the newly acquired Thunder God Sid. I mean, goddamn. It's not even fair anymore, to be honest. You kind of have to go out of your way from here on out to deny the easiness of the game, unfortunately, to add some challenge and interest into the remaining fights, besides the Limberry ones anyway. So your mileage may vary, but historically, I run through these maps with narrow problem, and most likely you won't either. Like I've said before, far back in the start of this video, the spikes of difficulty in this game, the pacing, and perhaps most tactics games maybe, are akin to a wonky heartbeat, you know? Every once in a while, it'll beat erratically, but most of the time it's rather flat or dormant. Tactics games in general general have this issue, except maybe XCOM, and games that are more based in Iron Man modes or permadeath mode, where heavy inclines of pacing is the norm. Next up is Lake Posis, the sort of uh, Salt Lake City of Ivalice, as it were, a dried wasteland of what used to be a paradise, and much like SLC, no one wants to be there, no one wants to stay, and it's filled with vengeful spirits who want nothing more than to suck the life force out of you for their own sordid deeds. Or, or uh, maybe that was Chicago. Uh, Cleveland? Hmm. It could be Philly. I mean, it does kind of sound like Orlando, if we're being honest, but... Uh... Wait, what were we talking about again? Oh, right, right, right. Undead creatures out for your total destruction. Okay, definitely Los Angeles, son. Anyway, this map can be either stupidly easy or stupidly frustrating, depending on your party makeup. If you have some oracles or Beowulf or Mustadio or white mages or chemists, then this map is straight cookies and milk and nap time with belly rubs. But if you have none of those, then this map is more like orange juice and toothpaste, you know? Midnight texts from your ex you thought you'd never hear from again asking about where it all went wrong. And no, Amanda, we will not be visiting this conversation again as I have different kinds of ghosts and specters to deal with right now. Good day. So not only can the ghosts teleport to any tile on the map, they can shoot their ectoplasm at you from a few tiles away, thus negating most reaction abilities you may have that could retaliate damage. Ah, but there's even more. Not only do you have to kill the ghosts like any other enemy, but instead of turning into crystals, they have a chance to revive at the end of their countdown with full health, ready to goo your party up all over again. So what could take 15 minutes now may take well over an hour. It all depends on how you approach the battle. When you're done dealing with the undead, we cut to Dystark and Lawfrey having a little parlay, a little chit chat. 
Dice Dark has some stipulations about who will rule Ivalice now that he's assumed control of the Northern Sky's army. He does not wish to accede to the church. Lawfrey reminds Dice Dark of whom made his ascension even possible in the first place, but Dice Dark, the ever-present politician says it was the Southern Sky assassins that killed Lard and no one else, wink wink, nudge nudge. Lawfrey grows weary of the back and forth and so wishes to convince Dice Dark of who holds the true reins of power in Ivalice. Lawfrey asks where the poison of Besselat came from and Dice Dark responds with moss fungus spores of course. Lawfrey then explains why such a poison is so insidious that it doesn't leave the host's system readily and repeated exposure to it would kill without warning, uh, without so much a raised eyebrow, a trite if effective threat. Also essentially an allusion to the insidious nature of backroom politicking and clandestine ploys, but who needs subtext for watching the baddies be baddies here? Fuck around and find out is Lawfrey's gambit, a blackmailing as old as time. It's common knowledge that Dice Dark knows a thing or two about poisons, Lawfrey says, and wouldn't it be unfortunate if such information was coupled with the idea of, oh I don't know, say regicide, that most fungus spores curiously only grow from the corpses of those it kills, even sprouting through the soil of graves. Still, even with all the chest thumping and throne maneuvering, Lafrey has a gift from the church to Dystarg, a zodiac stone or orosite. Regardless of Dystarg's willful scheming, it will matter not to the grand power of Saint Ajora and her demonic disciples. Ah, but would you look at that? The ever gallant Zalbag was doing a bit of his own snooping eavesdropping on their conversation. I'm sure that will have no repercussions at all, surely. And so now finally, we are at Limberry Castle, the last trio of battles that actually have a difficulty curve. Uh, there aren't any more maps to the end credits besides the Dark Dungeon, so in terms of story-related battles, this is pretty much it. At the Ivory Gates, we are greeted to Elmdor's Femme Fatales again, and again, they are just as annoying and deadly as they were on the roof of Riovain. However, this time, Ramza has the option to learn his last Squire ability, Ultima. And yes, for some fucking reason, Ultima is the most powerful magic spell in all of Final Fantasies, can only be learned by Ramza when he's a squire? Ah yes, the logic is flawless and I also love yellow snow. Regardless, if you have to get hit by an ultimate cast by one of the femme fatales in order to survive, to actually learn the ability, a la blue mages, but sometimes the AI simply does not want to comply, and it may take up to an hour to finally get one of them to cast it. Still, take out the demon buddies and stay alive long enough to get this ability as you will not have another chance to, and then simply beat either of the assassins down to low HP and the battle will end. Trap or not, Ramza pursues his enemies into the castle proper. But before we go to the next fight, we see Elmdor and Fulmarv taking inventory of who has been defeated and who still remains. Zalera, the next zodiac beast we must slay, has yet to bind to a host. Elmdor in this case, or so we think, but Elmdor suggests it matters not for the time is near where hosts will no longer be necessary and their master Azora is soon to rise to power, you know, yada yada yada, classic villain shit. Still, even Azora requires a host and Elmdor guesses correctly that it is to be Alma. The only thing they need now is to find the Necrohall, the ossuary that contains the High Seraph's soul. The Femme Fatales then pour into the room and inform Elmdor that Ramza has fallen into their little trap. And now Elmdor is eager to even the score. Fulmarv, however, rightly warns Elmdor that Ramza is no joke, and even Belias, Wegref that is, fell to him. Elmdor, of course, brushes that very accurate assessment aside and says, hold my beer, no worries, I got this bro. <laughs> sure you will buddy, sure you will. Now, normally in this upcoming battle, I would advise bringing a few thieves in order to steal all of Elmdor's Genji equipment, extremely rare and powerful items that are found nowhere else in the game, but the War of the Lions version, the PSP version that is, decided to give Elmdor an implicit passive that his equipment cannot be stolen or destroyed. Which is a real bummer, most likely because of the added multiplayer wireless ad hoc battles you and a friend could participate in in the various taverns in the game and therefore get these items in some other facet, but also probably because trying to deal with this vampire samurai in his insta-gib assassins and then trying to steal all of his equipment was just, I don't know, a little too punishing for the average player, because not only is stealing equipment naturally a low roll in this game, low percentage proposition, the fact that when either assassin dies, they turn into mega demons with even stronger dark magics that can kill parties in one hit. 
it makes sense that they would want to streamline this fight, but I don't know, let me tell you, in the OG PSX version, that's PlayStation 1, having to juggle these elements and filling your coffers with sweet, sweet Genji loot and then beating up that white-haired sparkly vampire and his sexy goons was one hell of an adrenaline spike in my little middle school brain. Sweaty palms, mom spaghetti, and all that jazz, it's genuinely a tough battle regardless, especially because of the vampire status effect. Even though you can negate this with special accessories if you want, there are some strats that simply rely on rolling the dice and hoping for the best. And you can win like this, but the vampire status effect goes like this. Elmdor bites one of your units and it's a guaranteed application of said vampire status effect. That unit is now no longer controllable by the player and will seek out any unit it can, much like being confused, and attempt to bite them and spread the status effect, like rabies. However, when a unit bites another unit, it drains the exact amount of damage it deals back as HP to the sucker. So this can effectively make a back and forth suck fest that would make Pornhub blush, as the computer just sort of, you know, goes at it for a while and you kind of stare blankly at your TV wondering if this is okay to even watch. Like maybe you should call someone or something? But if all your units become vampires, then the game ends. So you have to be extremely wary about bunching units together if you don't have the proper equipment on to negate the status effect. However, there is a bonus to this. The vampire status effect can be applied to the assassins and to Elmdor as well, weirdly enough. So this fight is simply a wild gamble at times, an RNG fest of frustrating proportions where every goddamn unit is biting and sucking to their heart's content, sometimes for a 45 minute straight, just hardcore back and forth, back and forth sucking. <clears throat> anyway, uh, the enemies hit hard and they hit fast, so good luck and remember to bring garlic. Uh, you will most likely have to restart this battle multiple times, uh, especially on the PlayStation 1 version, but persevere and you will achieve victory eventually. The next battle is a new one made for the PSP version. And depending on your party makeup, can either be a victory in one turn or a defeat in one turn. A mysterious voice beckons Ramza further into the undercroft of the castle and hey, would you look at that? It's our old popped collar rich boyfriend, Argith. Somehow he's returned. Apparently resurrected by the Lukavi's demonic powers, Argith is still quarreling away about how naive and useless Ramza is. Uh, to his point, however, Argith summons five demons to help kill us all and attempts to stall us from reaching Zalera slash Elmdor. And because of these hard hitting AOE spewing demons, this fight can potentially be brutal, but so long as you put the works on Argith as soon as possible, the battle ends without too much worry. I usually have no trouble in this fight, but the potential and ease of failure for sure is there. So mind your P's and Q's. Rams at mid battle casts aspersions towards the undead Argith, but in a weird turn of character, Argith rebukes such a denigration and heel turns and says, What does Ramza know of the plight of lesser houses and of lowborns? Argith seems to imbue a righteous fury in his words that were on a different side of the scale last time we met, where as before he understood the place and weight of such traditional hierarchies of class and caste and was almost prideful of his vassalage, now Argith seems to take umbrage with such inequalities, or at least takes the umbrage and applies it to Ramza. Perhaps it's the state of undeath and servitude to a demonic force of black magic, but this isn't the first or last time the PSP version seems to flip character motivation suddenly for the sake of a battle or cheap drama. For so much stellar reworking of the original script and tightening of the screws as it were, there are a couple of moments like this in the PSP version that are so cold on the tooth that it feels odd or uninformed or otherwise simply not very good storytelling. It's like some random intern wrote this part and a couple others at the last minute knew nothing of the prior character beats or motivations and simply wanted a cool villainous moment for Ramza to conquer. This happens with Delita as well, and more egregiously, I might add, that genuinely diminishes his character arc for seemingly no reason. It's like they took a perfectly cooked steak and then microwaved it for an extra minute and then slathered ketchup on top. It's like, <laughs> why though? But we'll come to that when we come to that. For now, Argith again has been defeated and we can move on to the final fight with Elmdor. All in all, it's a bit of a fever dream of a fight. The map was cool though, and it is funny hearing Argith call for his mommy after we trounce him. And now we come to the end of the line for our Vampire Liege Lord. 
at Limberry Castle Undercroft. Gravestones dot the claustrophobic map, as well as a narrow bridge leading to some larger coffins. How apropos. This is one of my favorite maps in the game, again, because the art team squeezes so much aesthetic and atmosphere from how little of paint they could actually use, the memory, the technical limitations that is. In addition, this map is clever because it basically forces a split in your and the enemy's party, where half your team will fight near the gravestones and maybe the bridge, while the other will fight atop the larger coffins. Because the map is so small, perhaps paradoxically, guns and archers are quite effective here, so keep them in mind if you want to go a ranged route, but otherwise some heavy hitters that can pump out fast amounts of physical damage is your best bet. Ramza calls out the wounded Elmdor to release Alma, but Elmdor reveals he never had her in the first place. It was just a ruse to draw him in and destroy Ramza. Yeah, surprise. Anyway, Elmdor, being the ever emo goth maid samurai, summons some ghosts and skeletons to fight at his side, presumably those of which the gravestones and coffins belong to, ancient warriors of old. Since all of his cards have been played, save one, Elmdor releases himself from his mortal farce and embraces the call of the Lukavi, transforming himself finally into Zalera, the third Lukavi we must destroy. Half Victorian Brit, half Cenobite, I mean look at them teeths, apparently this ghastly beast is honestly not that hard to kill. Even his ghosts and skelly boys aren't that hard to dispatch. The only real thing you need to worry about here is Elmdor's status magic, but otherwise it's rather easy to blast through his units or heal through his spells. Just slow or bind his goofy looking ass and you'll make this fight even easier. As the battle starts, Meladol, Meladol, Melot, <sighs> Meli pops in to fight with us, finally convinced of the Lukavi and their looming demonic threat. She's not that useful here as her equipment destroying abilities are only half as powerful because, you know, skeletons don't have equipment, but she can still do tons of damage at range and is equipped with Save the Queen, a night blade that has auto shell and auto protect on, thus making any unit that equips it, her in this case, a bit of an uber tank. So bring some white mages or chemists to insta kill any of the undead units with the raise or phoenix down trick and you'll pretty much be done. After the battle, Meli is told of the power of the Zodiac Stones, of how insidious their nature and ability to enthrall those who seek them out is, and how, most likely, Fulmarv and his ilk are the ones controlling even the church for their own ends. They have enough power to rival an army, but they seemingly want something even more. Meli states that the tales told the Lukave as beings of unimaginable power, but as Ramza points out, they were as mortal as anything else and could be felled as anything else. Meli has an apt and curious response to that point that legends are but stories embellished over time. A bit of a meta wink wink to how this whole game started I suppose. Uh, Meli also alludes to the fact that Dystarg now holds an Orsite as well. In any case, she, Meli, decides to join us, if you accept her in your party that is, and we can continue on to the last few battles of the game, well of the story anyway. After killing Zalera, we cut to Avilia and an injured Orin. Orin busts into Avilia's room and tells her that Sid was not the one who murdered Duke Goltana, and that escaped Besselat with Ramza. Ovilia at least believes the injured Orin, but before Ovilia can learn any more, Delita and his knights break into the room to apprehend Orin. Delita looking mighty fresh in his kingly coat, by the way. He orders his men to leave the room. Delita calls Orin a fool, and Orin calls Delita a traitor. Not exactly incorrect on either side, but nonetheless a tense situation is at hand. Delita appraises his actions by the lack of moral outrage at his somewhat obvious scheming. Not one tear has shed at the Duke's demise. Delita even made Sid persona non grata by framing him a dead man, as of course a dead man cannot be pursued. In his eyes, Delita has left everyone off the hook as long as they do the same for him. And finally, Ovelia sees the sheen of Delita's golden hue and realizes that Delita mostly only acts out of self-interest, regardless if he espouses merit or distinguishes motives as something more pure-hearted. Delita, however, makes a simpler point. Does Ovelia trust him or not? Because if she does, and to her that's a big if, then what Delita does is truly for the betterment of Ovelia and for Ivelis, even if that emboldens his own station. Delita orders Ovelia to return to her chambers, and she agrees, but then pulls a Zal bag and pretends to leave, but actually remains to eavesdrop. If only CCTV cameras existed in these futile times, eh? Orin assumes he is a dead man, but Delita still has plans for him. He wants him to bend the knee. 
Delita will flatten the southern sky, destroy the church. Well, Ramza will probably see to that, honestly, and unify Ivalice's fractured state back into solidarity. Oren thinks Delita a madman, but silently agrees with Delita's sentiment that what he does is right because Ivalice needs to be remolded and remade. Delita says that people yearn for a hero, yearn for a motive and direction that is not tainted by politicking and wringing hands in the shadow and the utter contempt and abuse for an upper caste that cares not for the masses. Delita is a common born man that will wrest the reins of the country's fate back into the people's hands, a true revolutionary he sees himself as. But like most aging folks out there who are watching this, the more things change, you know, the more things stay the same. Meet the new boss, same as the old. The maxim of time is a flat circle seems to always hold true. However, Delita's war Valmafra, the lady meant to keep tabs on him for the church, decides that this is an opportune time to assassinate Delita and brandishes a dagger ready to strike. Delita mocks her and tells her he knows what she was all along and good luck swing true. However, Delita strikes first and then we fade to black. The little 8-bit scream always gives me a giggle, I don't know why. Anyway, we cut back to Zalbag at the royal grave of his father. Zalbag is accompanied by a fading son and an apothecary, a chemist as it were and asks the trailing man if he sees what he thinks he sees. He asks if the chemist can identify a particular mushroom. The chemist identifies it as a moss fungus, of course, not the deadliest poison, but one you'd rather not eat anyway. Besides, moss fungus only grows on corpses, the chemist says, and that's a bad omen to find it growing on such. The house falls as the cap rises, so they say. Zalbag pays the man and lets him go, fully cognizant of the treachery now at play. Now Zalbag knows that his father was poisoned by Dystar that Ramza was telling the truth of the plotting behind the scenes, and that because of his stubbornness or blindness to the truth, everything is falling apart around him. His house, his family, the crown, the people is cast into a maelstrom. Everything is cast, so he does the only thing a dutiful son could do in that moment. He asks for his father's forgiveness. After some tavern missions and some leveling ups of jobs, a couple hours or so, uh, our next destination is back at Trade City Dorder. Ramza is stopped by another of the church's Templars, a man by the name of Kletien. He comes on behalf of Lord Falmar and traps Ramza in a clever time magic. However, Meli comes to our aid and stops Kletien from killing Ramza. Meli and Klet call each other traitors, past comrades now at odds, and Meli readies us for battle. We must beat down Kletien and his coterie of magical units. Kletien has a special job called Sorcerer, which has access to a which has access to A plus tier magics such as Flare and Dark Holy and Graviga. So the guy will hit hard if you're not ready with some low faith units. However, because he's a magic user, he has relatively low HP and bravery. So really, any unit that packs a physical wallet will have little trouble in defeating Kletien, possibly even in one hit. This is an easy fight no two ways about it but if you want the challenge don't bring any high bravery units and try to go for there our next map is back at Egros Castle Keep. Zalbek has Dystark at the point of a sword. He accuses his brother of regicide, and rightly so. Knights rush in to aid Dystark, and Dystark tells them that Zalbek has gone mad. Uh, during the fight, Dystark attempts to convince Zalbag and Ramza of his motivations, that his march for war is under the banner of stability and for the betterment of the realm, that House Beowulf must stand above all rest and uh, guide the masses into a golden age, blah, blah, blah. Zalbag purchases none of this, however, and reminds his brother that the name of his father of Beowulf stands, or at least stood, for honor and justice, not for ambition and sedition and murder. Dystark thinks himself a realist, however, thinking that such lofty ideals do not lead a people, and only cold, hearted pragmatism and power can do that. So who else to control these reins than House Beowulf? Dystark thinks himself the only real hero here, the only one willing to do what needs to be done to ensure his house is kept powerful. However, once we kill Dystark, the Orosite, the Zodiac Stone given to him by Fulmarv, awakens and beckons his desire to be made material. Dystark sheds his mortal form and becomes Edramelech, the Wrath. In this form, the once ambitious Dystark confirms to Zalbag that he indeed murdered their father simply because Barbneth wanted nothing to do with making House Bale stronger than it already was, that this entire civil conflict was instigated because of the ambition of one wayward son. Well, that in the Lukavi, but the point still stands. Adramalek transported Zalbag away and turns his ire onto Ramza, and now phase two of the fight begins.
Adramalek hits hard, but he's rather slow, and if you've kept your party healthy from phase one, he shouldn't be too hard to kill. He's got high HP, sure, but like the other Lukavi, physical damage seems to be the way to go and will demolish him easily. Just keep the pressure on him and he'll do his too soon executus death rattle and you will have officially destroyed all of House Beowulf. Ramza is four for four in the Lukavi battles, batting a full 1000. This guy is a demon killing machine, what can we say? We head from Egros to Milan Cathedral, the high seat of the Church of Glabidos. The first battle is outside the main cathedral against some priests and geomancers and mediators. And while the map is really cool, this fight is as easy as they come and honestly should be cakewalked for nearly any party makeup. Sometimes the mediators will put you to sleep or the geomancers might land a status effect or two, but everyone dies so quickly and easily. It's never really a proper concern. Just push in with heavy abandon and you'll achieve victory in no time. This battle, however, can be deceptively difficult. The map is very cool, one of my personal favorites in the game, but it is also very flat and slightly wide, so getting to the enemy before they can get to you can be relatively difficult. Each member of the church's templarate are ready to fuck you and your party up, and will do so if you're not careful. Fall Marv demands Ramza to relinquish the scriptures of Germanique, the heretical words that denounce the church as a ploy of the Lukavi, and of course Ramza does as he is told. Like, my guy, what possibly makes you think they will honor this promise to let Alma go if you give them the only missing piece of this whole fucking thing? Uh, Ramza, while a wrecking ball of a demon-destroying maniac in his own right, is basically as fresh as a daisy and just as dumb. In his constant need to let people attempt to do the right thing, Argith, uh, Delita, Zalbag, Dystarg, th these church cucks. Ramza constantly gets one-upped and betrayed. Surprised, Pikachu is like, damn man, take the hint, brother. Anyway, of course we are betrayed, and of course we have to do battle with Falmarv. Luckily for us, all we have to do is damage any of the three enough to teleport them away, so there's really no need to go after one particular person. So that usually means going after Kletian, because he has the least amount of HP and is the closest. The third and final battle is in the underground sanctuary of Milan, a sort of holy resting place under the cathedral. Another great map, by the way, claustrophobic and well-designed. However, Falmarv informs us that we are about to die. Oh my god, no way! <laughs> Falmarv calls upon his oarsight to summon some demons and an undead Zalbag. Zalbag has been taken over by dark magics and begs for Ramza to kill him or he may kill Ramza first. Zalbag, much like Elmdor, has the ability to turn units into vampires, so expect a wild and crazy fight if you don't have anything to negate that. It's, it'll be Elmdor 2.0 all over again, let me tell you. I love Zalbag's hero portrait in this fight. He looks all gaunt and undead, which makes the task of killing him all the more painful. To see Zalbag in such a bastardized version of himself is sad, definitely, but the battle itself is really fun to play. The demons hit like dump trucks and Zalbag will delete units of yours if you get turned into a vampire, so the battle is quite the hectic one if you don't go straight for Zalbag. With my dancer, though, I basically kill all the demons with one dance via petrify or stop, so for me, this was a nat 20 roll easy peasy win, even if Ramza went full sparkly vampire. After the battle, we find the High Confessor Marcel slain, still with the sword embedded into his spine. In his final words, Marcel tells us where the Templar has gone, back to where it all started, Orbone Monastery. And if we decide to head there, we will be in the final few battles of the game. However, we can also elect to do the super not so secret side dungeon, dark dungeon, or deep dungeon a series of difficult, literally pitch black battles that you can do in order to find some of the best gear in the game, as well as the best summon ability in the game, as well as the hidden secret heretical 13th Zodiac Stone. So for the next bit, I'll quickly go through the Dark Dungeon experience, even though it took me nearly five to seven hours of playing and replaying, trying to get all of the items, it'll probably only take around a few minutes to go through all of it in this video. Not much story is had here, but definitely fun as hell gameplay. Uh, Dark Dungeon, or Midlight's Deep as it's called in the War of the Lions version, is a series of battles that takes place in a pitch black map. The only way to light the map is to crystal any unit, which allows you to see the map properly like a fucking light bulb. The goal in these battles is to find the exit by sending a unit to stand on a specific tile until a message pops up that says you're allowed to progress to the next stage, deeper into the massive cavern. However, like all of the other maps in the game, when a character with the chemist movement ability move fine lands on a certain tile, you have a chance to collect an item that was hidden there. 
that was hidden there. And in every one of the Dark Dungeon maps, there are at least three tiles that provide either an extremely rare or an extremely powerful item that is found nowhere else in the game. Now, if you don't have a guide that tells you specifically where to go, and I did back in the day, if you remember, my mom bought me that Prime game guide, then finding any of these items or exits will be an exhausting, time-worn exercise of simply going onto every single tile and mapping it out from there, then restarting the game and attempting to grab all of the rare rolls of the tiles while still dealing with the usually rather difficult enemy parties. Grinding gear games and Chris Wilson salivate at the thought of this, I'm sure, but at least once you know where the tiles are, it's rather easy to do everything you need to do to move along to the next map. Another bonus these maps provide is the poachable monsters you can find here. So remember to bring Luso if you want to do that. Some of these monster types can be poached for some really good items like the Night Sword Defender from the Gold Treants. So this entire dark dungeon thing will fill your pockets with all of the good loot this game has to offer. Unless of course you do the multiplayer battles, but honestly I'm not including these because good fucking luck trying to find any human with a PSP near you in 2023. In any case, you'll have to make your way through 10 maps until you get to the final map of the deep dungeon where you'll meet Elidibus, the secret sorcerer who holds the secret zodiac stone Serpentarius. He's rumored to be the hero of the 50 years war, or a hero, the war with the Ordalia that predated this whole civil conflict, and how he came to have the zodiac stone is a little unclear but his sprite is badass so of course that makes him the ultimate badass wizard of the game like the spell ultima if a summoner can survive the hit from zodiac the final secret summon ability that the job can get that unit will learn the spell at the end of the battle otherwise he's actually rather easy to deal with i mean you can stop and slow the guy and his little minions don't really do that much damage but if he does get zodiac off on some of your units it's basically a one shot so the real difficulty in this fight is trying to get him to cast that summon on one of your units before you get overwhelmed. Still, even after you collect all the secret items in the maps and beat a little bit, you can come back anytime and replay the map with new units and grind and poach to your heart's content. But now that we're done with the side content of the game, we will continue on to the end of our journey and to the last maps of the story. Under Orbone Monastery, Lawfrey commands some monks and knights to prevent us from reaching the Templarate. But after Deep Dungeon, we are so absurdly overpowered at this point, it's kind of sad how these chumps think they can do anything to our party or to Ramza. I mean, it feels like I could go naked into this battle and sneeze on any of these enemy units and they'd explode into a million particles. This is a terribly easy fight and therefore not much to be said. On to the next. In the next battle, the Monastery Vaults, we catch up with Lawfrey. This is a pretty unique map where we try to stop a summoning ritual. Near any of the Time Mages or Black Mages are these little holes, gaps that prevent most units from getting up close and personal, so it requires an interesting party makeup if you don't want to get stomped. But if you bring, say, Sid or Melly or Agrius, you'll have no problem. Ramza guesses that Falmarv is no longer human, as really none of the Templar are anymore at this point, and Lawfrey revels in this fact. However, once we beat him down, he attempts to breach existence with a summoning spell of sorts. He calls upon his Lukavi and a magical sigil forms under our party's feet, beams of light shining through. In an instant, all units on the battlefield disappear. In another flash of light, Ramza is transported atop a profaned plinth, uh, Lawfrey choking below him. Lawfrey explains that they are in the Necro Hall of Milan, the holy or unholy, as it were, resting place of the High Seraph Ultima, or more commonly known as Saint Ajora. It is twisted and warped, place of destruction and death and some pretty cool looking maps. Lafrey uses his last of his demonic power to deny passage back to Ivelis. And now we are stuck here whether we like it or not and have to see this thing through to the end. So we head for Alma. The next battle is against Kletian again, the Templar Mage. He is accompanied by ninjas, samurais, and time mages. So if you're underleveled or are going for a low level equipment handicap, this fight can actually be a nice challenge, but of, of course not for me as I am just geared to the teeth now and there's nothing that can stop me. In fact, I'm pretty sure I one shot Kletian when I choose to end the fight. And Kletian goes out like he came in with a, who the fuck was that guy? Sort of whimper, but whatever, on to the next. Now this fight is kind of cool. I think besides Deep Dungeon, 
or Dark Dungeon or uh, Mid Lights Deep, whatever the hell you want to call it. This is the only map that has a split section where if your units don't have enough jump or range with their attacks, you will just get mauled by the enemy party. Not only does Barrack, the poison guy from the desert, if you remember, have super long range with his guns, but he's accompanied by a plethora of dragon buddies that also have powerful breath attacks and range. This is a fun fight for a poacher as well as rather challenging. All of the Templars so far don't have much else to say besides a trite this is where it ends for you, hero, kind of epithet. And this is a bit of a problem with the last few battles in this game. The story and characters kind of just run out of steam and peter out. Like, that that's all we get after all this machinations and, and plotting and... and interesting character beats from chapters one through three. We don't get a Luthen level made my mind a stunless space philosophical monologue from any of these Templars. We simply get a stop right there, criminal scum. It's frustrating because the first half or two thirds of this game are genuinely great and well written and draw you in, but it feels like maybe this needed to be out of the door early at some point because the last few battles, while fun and cool looking, in terms of character moments are lacking, no doubt. Still, Beric does give a little insight into his actions nonetheless, stating that his hatred for the status quo, the need to kowtow to the highborns of any nation was so damning to him, was so unappealing and boring and rote and stifling that he'd rather give his soul and that exact freedom of choice over to a demon instead? <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, meet the new boss, same as the old, I guess. Anyway, great logic there, Barrack, buddy. I mean, even Ramza, my god, the most naive, over-trusting rube of a young man can see that freedom bought from one must be paid by the other. That ultimate power corrupts ultimately. Still, just kill the dragons or go after Barrack, and this fight is rather easy. Now on to Fulmarv at the airship graveyard, the final map of Final Fantasy Tactics. Falmarv stands above a sleeping Alma, attempting to get the stones to react and rebirth their goddess Ultima, the High Seraph. Ramza and company find Falmarv, and in this moment, Falmarv realizes that the Blood Angel must require a sacrifice of blood to rouse from her slumber. I mean, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, who doesn't know that? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Regardless, Falmarv knows the time is nigh and so calls upon the power of the Lukavi of the Zodiac Stone and transforms into Hashmel, bringer of order. Really fucking cool looking sprite, by the way. He basically takes a blood oath in front of us and stands really hard for the High Seraph. And I mean like super hard. So hard, in fact, that after we beat him down, Alma still hasn't transformed, so Hashmel relinquishes his own life in order to satiate the sacrifice of blood needed. Now, Alma has transformed into Saint Ajora. The final battle can begin. In a strange twist of fate, however, much like Rafa and Merrick, Alma, half Ajora, half herself, begs Ramza not to let her live and that she doesn't want these events to continue. And so because of this, the stone fulfills this intent and wish and splits Azora from Alma safely. The Orsite, the Zodiac Stones, are neither good nor evil, they are simply magical tools made to amplify the values of their holders. In a fit of magical rage, Saint Ajora transforms into the High Seraph Ultima, a sexy crimson latex goddess, uh, uh, a dangerous foe that needs to be defeated. Yes, dangerous, sexy foe. <clears throat> Saint Ajora Glabados, the founder of the Church of Glabados, as you may have guessed, serves as host to Ultima, the High Seraph. While she had died a thousand years ago, she has been quietly gaining power in the shadows, as any good fantasy villain does. During the fight, she calls upon some demon buddies that we've taken care of many times before, so nothing on the tactical front there is new to deal with, but the High Seraph herself has some powerful magics at her disposal, namely Ultima and Grand Cross. After we kill Ajora, however, she transforms fully into Ultima, a sort of bone puppet looking demon, pretty cool sprite, all things considered. And that Ultima hits like a truck though, so no matter what level you're at, uh, it's gonna be tough. But honestly, it isn't that fast or versatile, and by this point, your party could have Sid or Agrius, or it could be dual wielding knights or mathematicians or whatever, so the power level skews heavily in your direction regardless. And much like most Final Fantasies, the final boss is rarely the most difficult or powerful, so any way you slice it, this final battle really isn't too difficult. But I will say, when you kill Ultima, his, her, its death sequence is badass, and quite the spectacle back in the PSX days, let me tell you what.
After the fight, we cut to a funeral service being held for Alma Bale, the presumably last member of a once great house, now destroyed completely. And because Ramza was a halfling, a half-breed, a bastard in the eyes of tradition, a Jon Snow-like character, he is denied such a funeral service, let alone a burial. Oren appears after the others leave, telling us of Delita and Ovelia's wedding, the tale of a common-born man rising to the highest echelon of power and thus uniting the fractured state of Ivalis, a tale that will stand the test of time it would seem a story made for the legends. Orin still thinks the lead a man of pure intentions. Whether or not those intentions are ethically pure, he is a man of his word and does not wish to commit heinous acts of wanton violence like his predecessors would and did. Even going as far as to make it seem Valmafra, his ward and would-be assassin if you remember, died in their confrontation but actually let her live and let her go. Orin laments his father's apparent death, still not quite believing Ramza is dead himself. But just then, as Orin is about to walk away, he glimpses what looks to be Ramza and Alma atop some chocobos, striding across their graveyard. He calls out to them, but they do not turn back, for their future lies ahead now, their past now truly dead and buried. The siblings have a new lease on life, ready to live it out as they see fit. Orin, probably the only person in all of Ivalisian history to utter the words thank you to Ramza and to his heroic, selfless deeds in saving the world, watches as they ride by. He is quoted as saying he does not understand what drives men to do what they do in all facets, but he knows the true hero of this tale is the man forgotten. Orin would spend the next few years gathering a accounts of what happened and present these findings to a council that would later elect a new high confessor for the church. Uh, but however, as these things tend to go, when considering religion and truth, fearing the accounts or an accumulated that show the church as a corrupt vessel for power, the historical genesis of the church and of St. Ajora, the church captures Oren and burns him alive at the stake as a heretic. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Okay. Uh, Oren's papers lay dormant for centuries, even forgotten about by the church. But our Islam Darai, the a lineage born from Oren, has found the truth, and this game is the retelling of said truth, that Ramsay Beowulf was and is the true hero of the Zodiac Braves and the true hero of the War of the Lions. So after the credits roll, we are treated to a post-credit scene involving now King Delita and now Queen Avilia. Delita comes to Avilia on her birthday with a bouquet of flowers, a doting husband as it were, and as he gives them to her, Avilia stabs Delita in the gut, thinking him as just like the rest, a user, a manipulator, an opportunist. And then in retaliation, Delita stabs and presumably kills Ovelia. And it sort of just ends there? <laughs> this scene was not originally in the PSX version, PlayStation 1 version, added to the PSP version, which I guess was to give lip service to the idea that Delita was just as Ovelia thought him as, a user and manipulator, and he was to be sure, but his goals were that of a better realm, of a country more fairly distributed among its people, and all of his actions, regardless of morality, did engender this goal. It feels rather odd to have Ovelia just so suddenly attempt regicide, and then die, in a blink of an eye, and not elaborate at all any further, and just end the game officially. <laughs> Maybe it was to tie in with the murder of Oren by the church to sort of hammer home the point that history tends to repeat itself in various ways, that the players may differ, but the play remains the same, which is a fair assessment. It's just the scene feels so sudden and just honestly a bit unnecessary. For the vast majority of the PSP version, the War of the Lions version, that is, uh, the script doctoring, the pacing of certain beats and moments in the story is vastly superior to the mistranslated or sloppily localized PlayStation 1 version. There are still some curiosities, some odd choices that I don't inherently understand or agree with, uh, mostly to do with Delita. I feel like the FMVs that were added paint him as a little too heroic, a little too white knightish, but the extra battles and or scenes paint him in the opposite light, as a little more cold-hearted and duplicitous and ambitious. It makes his character seem fuzzy or out of focus, and maybe that's their intent, but I don't think it works as well as Delita being a straightforward anti-hero or morally gray hero instead. The added stuff with him is too on the nose in either direction, which then makes his motivation seem murkier and less well written or thought out. But all of these points now bring me to the final part of this video, you know, my general critique or overall thoughts on this game. So, after all these battles, all the grinding and the job swapping and the secret hunting after all the twists and turns in the story. How does this further my thesis? If I ever had one, I suppose. Why does this game reach the pinnacle of the tactics RPG subgenre? And why is this game often quoted 
or at least seen as a gold standard in that subgenre. What is it about tiles that makes masons and RPG nerds alike light up with such glee? While this game might realistically take you around 35 to 40 hours to do everything and beat everything, in terms of your average JRPG or even Western console RPG, and definitely any MMO RPG, this is but a drop in the time bucket, a peasant's meal. In terms of difficulty, as long as a player is able to click the X button and can spell their own name in a reasonable time frame, the game is considered a walk in the park, sans that we graphite. In terms of aesthetics or graphical fidelity, I mean it's a PlayStation 1 game so you're going to get what you're going to get, but even at the time it was relatively cute and quaint and not really a console seller. And as I pointed out before at the beginning of this three and a half hour video, the cultural or industry impact this game and the genre has is about as powerful as an underwater fart. So why does this game require such a video, such a glowing reception or retrospective? Why does this genre keep making games that barely move the needle in terms of popularity or relevance? Well, I'll answer that question with another question. Why do you look at the contents of your toilet before you flush? Why do you air drum when you clearly don't know how to actually drum? Why does the odor of gasoline smell so damn good? Why do you think cat girls are hot. My point being, why does something have to exist in a perfectly neat little box tagged with every possible understanding of nuance or digression laid out in front of you like a blueprint? Sometimes it's the aversion towards this understanding, or at least the pursuit of knowing you'll fully never know why, that makes such endeavors, such art or sciences, so appealing. It is the ineffable, the curious, the soupy mixture in your hands that runs between your fingers. The pursuit or the journey, not the destination. I can give you general ideas as to why tactics games have such a fervent audience like fighting game nerds or racing game dorks, but unless you are one, you may never understand. Meatloaf is for the meatloaf lovers after all. The most we can do is let you gaze into such an abyss and hope that it gazes back into you like this video perhaps, but that is simply the abstract, the human curiosity that venerates such a subgenre like tactics games. What does this game in particular do that which may further this concept or at the very least make people want to play it? I think in regards to story, it's the Shakespearean overtures, the Game of Thrones-like fantasy story that propels one to want to keep going from map to map, even if one may not like the turn-based gameplay. On one hand, you have a conflict with its own structure and characters and themes, and in the other, you have a different conflict and characters and themes. In TV writing terms, this is called an A plot and a B plot. Sometimes these plots don't overlap, but most of the time they do, which creates a nice pace of trying to deduce what's going on between the two, like a connect the dots booklet at a doctor's waiting room. And in regards to combat, the reason one wants to push buttons for hours on end, that is, I think as long as players likes, say, puzzles or crosswords or deck building or anything that requires a form of strategy and logical compliance, a player will most likely enjoy the combat or gameplay of tactical RPGs. Final Fantasy Tactics does provide this, although not to the tactical degree that, say, XCOM would, but to appease that monkey brain, that lovely little synapse that lights up when we connect point A to point B, this game does provide a sense of that very well, I think. You get nice little colored sprites, awesome 16-bit sound effects, a banging OST, and a minor dopamine drip in the form of new gear and blue numbers that making things go better. It's essentially a very slow casino or parlor game with a bit more bells and whistles attached. The function of the game provides what is exactly on the tin, in other words. And maybe that sounds like obfuscation because I don't really have an answer. Haha, but you watched this whole thing, gotcha. Or maybe there isn't a true one answer to why people like things they like, but at the very least I hope this video was entertaining or whatever. At the most, I hope this video made you want to play the game or any other tactical RPG for that matter. Give it a go, they're really fun. I mean, you just sat through three and a half hours of this playthrough slash retrospective slash personal musing, so you do have the constitution to sit through an hour long turn based battle, let me tell you. Again, to end this, and to quote Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead one last time, the colors red, blue, and green are real. The color yellow is a mystical experience shared by everyone. And Final Fantasy Tactics is the most yellow of them all. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.